I wish to pay my respects to both elders past, present and emerging, elders from all nations, especially all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members joining us here today. Wurundjeri is a part of the Kulin Nation and of the Warong language group. Wurundjeri country extends from the inner city of Melbourne across to the Great Dividing Range, west to the Werribee River, south to the Mordialic Creek and east to Mount Borbor. A big thank you to everybody who has helped make this event possible this morning. Woman Jekka, welcome and I hope everybody has a fantastic afternoon ahead. Thank you very much and enjoy. Um, yeah, thank you. Just before we go, um, me, I'm from Goran Goran country. Uh, much better place than this. No, we got beach. Um, <laughs> Probably warmer. <laughs> but we got a lot of different countrymen and women in the room, and we all acknowledge our presence in your country. We, as part of this conversation, introduced cultural conversations around values and kinship and the importance of building a kinship structure and approach not only in terms of bringing this people, this, this people, these peoples together um, to work together as family in a cultural way. So it's bringing ancient cultural ways of knowing into modern ways of doing in this data space. So uh, it's a pleasure to be on your country. Thanks, and we'll it. see what I'm looking at. Thank you next time. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. So uh, a few little housekeeping issues. Good morning, Isabella. And I saw you sneaking in. Penny, where are you? <laughs> Snuck out again. <laughs> oh, there you are. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple of people before we commence. Nicola is moderating all the people online. So there will be, I don't know, how many people, Nicola? Okay, so there'll be 52 people also uh, online uh, and Nicola will moderate questions that they may have. I'll forewarn you that time is of the essence today um, and I've been instructed to keep everybody on time including myself. Dave if you can stand up. Dave is my timekeeper. He will give you a five minute warning and he'll give you a one minute warning and if you're not finished by then Dave can fight. As I said to Colin, um, when I speak about cultural values, uh, I, I live and breathe that. Every one of us in this room are unique and special and I, I feel as I'm repeating myself to many of you, but we are all unique, we're all special, none of us are perfect. We're all in this place and space for a reason. We're trying to make sense of the data commons conversation. We're trying to get some synergy, some clarity and some structure going forward. That's what we're here for. Yesterday was an, uh, just an appetizer, really, um, and today is a process of continuing that conversation. But most importantly, when I talk about kinship, you are one family of people. You all connect back to humanity. Today and tomorrow is about just continuing the journey that you're on. The values that I always talk to, uh, cultural values, ancient human values are around caring, sharing and respect. Each and every one of us have got a value and respect who's in this room. Value each other's opinions and views um, and enjoy each other's company. That's most important because 100 years from the day, sister, that stripy shirt's not going to be here and neither are you. So enjoy the journey, enjoy this last two days, uh, this next two days. And um, Rose, we started early, you know. <laughs> you know you don't sneak in this late. Stop trying to bail her out, kid. <laughs> so enjoy the, the next two days. And uh, Nicola, if the people from online um, have questions, just please let us know. Last time we were here, I was conscious of uh, the fact that I forgot them. And so we need not to forget the people online. So um, today, the aim is to showcase the research infrastructure that you're creating in the Hass and Indigenous RDC space and look at the potential for improved research outcomes that it supports. And I've asked Kit to give me two key outcomes to focus on. And the first one is to get an improved understanding or awareness across this audience 
and the second one is to uptake the RDC infrastructure by researchers, yeah? So that's what we're here for. What did you come for, besides big lunch and little lunch? Yeah, that's good. Well, you won't learn unless you ask. But see everyone around you today? They're all the same as you. They're all family, yep? So don't hesitate to ask questions. Yep. What's your name? Ernest. Otis, as in ready. <laughs> I'm catching what you picture. So, <clears throat> as is custom, we roll out the beloved Jennifer Fuster. Fuster, where are you, Jen? Yes, well, I'm going to do that together with you. To me, the code of conduct, if we actually embrace kinship and we value who we are in terms of our diversity and our connections back to humanity and we embrace the values of caring and sharing and respect, there's no need for a code of conduct. Not everybody understands <laughs> where each other is thinking. We're all different in our own ways, but you're all here collectively together. If you have issues where things get triggered or you need or you feel upset about something, Jennifer's the person that you go to. And we want to resolve those things on the run, if that's okay. Yeah? Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. All right. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. Okay, let's go. We didn't do the exits. Okay. Let me go back. Hang on. Okay, what I'm seeing up here is not what I'm seeing up there. Mary, where's Mary? <laughs> We've got oh, there we go. Agenda. So does this one work? Okay. And do we have a mouse so we can scroll through the speaker notes? Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, um, I would go back to the slide so that I had the prompts to know what we needed to talk about. But the fire exits are out near the lifts. Uh, the bathrooms, if you walk past where the tea and coffee is, so don't go to the right to go to the tea and coffee. Go the next little um, passageway, go down there, that's the bathrooms. Um, is there anything else I need to cover? If you have any issues, come and talk to me. <laughs> Oh. If you don't get the food you need, it'll probably be somewhere separate, and if it's not, and you've got a day at the need, talk to me. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Can we go to the next slide deck? Oh, yay. Brilliant. Does this work? Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Right. So, my name is Jenny Fuster. I'm I'm the director of the Hass and Indigenous Research Data Commons for the ARDC and I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about how the Hass and Indigenous Research Data Commons came into being uh, and what we've been working on for the last three years. Tomorrow we'll go on to the future um, Hass and Indigenous RDC. Okay, so I too would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting here today in Nam. Uh, I pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, but I also pay respects to Indigenous people in the room and who are joining us online as well. Um, I am a white settler person. I was born and I still live on Ghana lands in South Australia. All right, so we'll begin with a bit of background on the ARDC. So the ARDC has over 100 staff based at host institutions around Australia. And we have 26 member institutions that you can see here on this slide. So if you are from an institution that you don't see on that slide um, and you want to get in touch to find out how your institution can become a member, once again, you can come and have a conversation with me uh, or any of the other ARDC staff who are here today. 
So the ARDC was established under the Australian Government's National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, or NCRIS, in 2019. It was created from three earlier data-focused national digital research infrastructure organisations, the Australian National Data Service, NECDAR, and Research Data Services. It's a not-for-profit company limited by guarantee, which along with the other 25 organisations supported uh, by NCRIS that you can see here, provide national research infrastructure for Australian researchers. So many of you will recall the ARDC undertaking open call processes for national data assets, platforms and so on. And from the work that we did on those open calls, it became clear that we couldn't meet the demand of the research community for digital research infrastructure. So our new strategy is based around the concept of a thematic research data commons that enable us to support the maximum number of researchers through a smaller number of strategic priority areas. And the first of these thematic RDCs to come into being was actually the Hass and Indigenous Research Data Commons. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm aware that Hass is actually not a theme at all. Um, it's just a conglomerate of disciplines <laughs> that has been brought together under the moniker of Hass. So, but what is a research data commons? So the term commons, as many of you will know, derives from the medieval European idea of management of shared land. And it was later popularised as a way of referring to shared resources. So for us, a research data commons brings together people, skills, data and related resources such as storage, compute, software and models into one system. By providing integrated resources and easy to use interfaces, it enables researchers to speed up their existing research and to undertake research that wasn't possible before. And for me, the people is actually pivotal to what we do and you know uh, why would we do it if it weren't for the people so that's always front of mind for me so I'm gonna um, now provide some background on how we came about and the portfolio of work that we've undertaken to date so in 2016 the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap identified opportunities to accelerate the impact of Hass and Indigenous research. It recommended improving the overall coordination of research infrastructure that supports access to and analysis of physical and digital collections using tools such as digitisation, aggregation and interpretation platforms. The Australian Government Department of Education subsequently commissioned three studies that identified a number of investment-ready programs that would benefit from national research infrastructure funding. And you can download those scoping studies from the ARDC website. While not all recommendations within those scoping studies were funded at the time, the activities earmarked to participate in the initial round of development displayed um, an advanced state of readiness to participate in and benefit from a Hassan Indigenous RDC. And those activities were improving Indigenous research capabilities, which is led by distinguished Professor Marcia Langton at University of Melbourne, the Language Data Commons of Australia, led by Professor Michael Hoare at University of Queensland, Integrated Research Infrastructure for Social Sciences, which was led by uh, Associate Professor Stephen McEachran at ANU, which is now wound up and we're in the planning for our next social sciences phase, and the Trove Researcher Platform, which was realised as two distinct but connected pieces of work Trove Enhancements, which was led by the National Library of Australia, 
and the ARDC Community Data Lab, which was led by the ARDC. Um, and you can learn more on our website uh, if you just search for Hass and Indigenous. So today we'll be showcasing the work we've done to date across the Hass and Indigenous RDC, which I'm sure you'll find fun and informative. But you've got to come back tomorrow because then we're going to focus on the future of the Hass and Indigenous RDC and the four years and the new projects that we have ahead of us. Uh, and please subscribe to our newsletter. We all say that. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand over now. I don't know if I'm handing back to you or shall I hand straight on to Inga Grant? Okay, Grant's going to introduce Inga for our next exciting instalment. Thank you. Thank you. Relax, Jen, relax. You make me nervous. Now, Inga, uh, I'm going to get you to come up shortly. Now, are you coming up already? Oh, well, I was going to introduce you in Italiano, see? Grazie. Buongiorno. <laughs> Come sta? Va bene. Si, bene, grazie. Ironically, I can speak more Italian than I can speak Goreng Goreng. There's a, there's a history and a reason behind that. But anyway, a couple of days, da Samara, we'll work that out. But Inga and I, unbeknown to us, prior to this morning, we relate to each other through our Italian ancestry. My deadly sister over there, we relate to each other in our Aboriginal ancestry. We're all family here, if we actually truly understand it. Jan, I picked up on your little definition there. You realise data commons, that's kinship. Your definition of data commons is kinship. So how do we embrace ancient ways of knowing and apply that in modern ways of doing through a cultural lens as part of the challenge? Inga is going to address that. No, you're not. So, Inga is from the Humanities... She's going to talk to Humanities Infrastructure in Australia... Uh, the Australian Academy of Humanities. Um, he joined the Academy of, Australian Academy of Humanities as Executive Director in February 2023. Before joining the Academy, he held positions as Principal Research Strategist um, Australia, Chief Executive of External Relations at the University of Adelaide and the Director Vice Chancellor, University of Canberra. And Yamu. Thank you, Grant. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and would also like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to all Indigenous colleagues who are here today. And I'm looking forward to some excellent conversations um, over the course of the day and tomorrow around Indigenous research data platforms and the very important issue of Indigenous data sovereignty. Thanks, Jenny, also um, for the invitation and opportunity to present milestones in humanities research infrastructure. This has been a major priority for the Academy of the Humanities for a long time. Many of you will know my friend and colleague in the Academy Secretariat, Dr Kylie Brass, our legend in residence for Haas Research Infrastructure, and our former uh, long-serving executive director, Dr Tina Parolin. These two, and before them, Dr John Byron, worked with many fellows of the Academy for more than 20 years to get us to where we are today. Well, Kylie is on leave and John and Tina have moved on. I've been the executive director for five minutes. I didn't actually start in 23, I started in 24, so I'm new. I don't have a doctorate, but I do bring one thing to this event, and that is an enormous respect for what has been achieved to date and the determination to build on the progress we've collectively made. Since 2003, the Academy has written over 100,000 words in submissions and reports on the need for Haas research infrastructure. Looking back for much of that journey, the despair... Oh, looks like my slides... Broken. Sorry. Looking back for much of that journey, the despair was palpable. 
We made the case for Hass and Indigenous research infrastructure again and again, seemingly falling on deaf ears and closed wallets. When you are prosecuting a long-term argument, it can feel like change is moving like molasses. It's hard to see the forest for the trees. So at this juncture, some 20 years since the introduction of NCRIS, it's enlightening to look back and take a moment to acknowledge just how far we've come, how fast the technology's moved on, and also to renew our collective intent to address unfinished business. So we begin this speech in the deep past as far as research data infrastructure is concerned. It's 2003. There are no smartphones and no social media. We're in the BT era before Trove, the love child of the National Library of Australia staff, which was launched in 2009. The closest thing we have to an aggregator of Haas data is the Australian Library's bibliographic network and that's metadata only. Brendan Nelson is in his first year as Minister for Education. He has taken a personal interest in the high level consultations on research, including research infrastructure. The fundamental rationale for nation scale infrastructure spending was to maximise return from investment in research, Australia must provide researchers with access to modern and relevant research infrastructure. Humanities researchers and advocates could see that digitisation and digital infrastructures would be essential for the growth and relevance of their disciplines, which comprise some 40% of Australia's research effort. It would be foolish, we said, to ignore almost half of the research system for which affordable investments in digitisation and analytical tools would be transformative. In developing NCRIS, we pressed the case to government that they needed to support Haas disciplines to join the digital revolution. But we knew we were up against it. We noted the terms of reference for the review of the NCRIS process had a distinct orientation towards funding of science, engineering and technology. The committee that was charged with developing the NCRIS strategic roadmap was set the objective of research for economic development, national security, social wellbeing and environmental sustainability. So just to repeat, social wellbeing was one quarter of the NCRIS committee's remit. In 2006, the first NCRIS strategic roadmap was published under a new education minister, Julie Bishop. Still, no smartphones, no social media, still in digital prehistory, but very significant investments in digital research infrastructure were about to flow. Devastatingly, of the 15 research investments the NCRIS committee proposed, none were for humanities and social sciences. The closest that came was counterterrorism. The report authors decided that Haas was best served by generic system-wide investments. In other words, the internet. If you'll indulge me a rugby metaphor, the committee had palmed the humanities off and left us face down in the dirt. It was only the sciences and technology who ran onto the infrastructure playing field with money to spend. At the Academy of the Humanities, we brushed ourselves off and kept doing our job consulting stakeholders, crystallising humanity's needs and doing what Academy scholars do best. The Academy published. The Turner Report by former President Emeritus Professor Graham Turner proposed a national digital scholarly archive for humanities researchers in Australia. It would provide public as well as academic access to key components of the nation's social and cultural history. It would be a nation building resource. In the Academy's submission to the 2008 roadmap, we argued that in view of the five years of neglect, a special effort is warranted on part of the NCRIS committee. The Haas field is a large and complex part of the national research enterprise and NCRIS is very new to it. This was because they had no Haas experts on any of their committees. 
Many of the previous errors were perpetuated because of fundamental misunderstandings about what HASS research is and how it is conducted. We said that research infrastructure investment must support the range of research activity actually undertaken through publicly funded research programs, i.e. there needed to be a platform for social and cultural knowledge, that NCRIS staff were needed with HASS expertise, and it should fund training to bring more HASS researchers up to speed with the digital transformation. And there was some progress. In 2008, the strategic roadmap reflected our advice that in the United States and Europe, major infrastructure investments in the social and cultural research sector had been made in the last five years. This second roadmap finally scoped but did not fund has specific e-research infrastructure. So the year 2008 marks the humanities entrance into the government's national infrastructure agenda as a funding focus in its own right, but still without any funding. The government's next research infrastructure roadmap was due in 2011. The Academy sought government assistance to support an orderly prioritised digitisation effort but you can hear the bitter fruit of experience in our phrase that there was a bottomless pit of analogue material that still needed to be digitised. We insisted that the best way forward was a partnership between government and the Haas research community. We drew attention to the then ARC CEO, Margaret Shields argument in The Australian in 2011, uh, where she warned that the lack of investment in Australia into Haas research infrastructure is having a cumulative effect in further disadvantaging these fields of research and that the lack of investment was dis distancing Australia's humanities community from opportunities for building ambitious collaborative projects. In our submissions to the government, the Academy had progressed from the Turner list of non-electronic resources for digitisation, for example, including uh, pre-1920 legal books and materials, census data, Australian periodicals and journals of opinion, to a list of exemplary resources, including Paradisic, Trove, Ausstage and Auslip, for example. These resources still comprise a large part of the headline humanities digital infrastructures. They've been our spearheads. Or maybe the better analogy is that they've been our door jams. They were what we've had to prise the door open, to get into the room, to get a seat at the table, and to get funded in the information age. Let's jump to 2015, the contemporary era. Everyone has a smartphone. Social media is making life hell for parents, but at least they get to unwind streaming some excellent TV series. Christopher Pine is Minister for Education and Training. He commissions the 2015 Clark Review of Research Infrastructure. The review team includes the current Chief Scientist, Professor Ian Chubb, and the future Chief Scientist, Professor Alan Finkel. The Clark Review highlights the irreplaceable scientific collections curated by CSIRO and other institutions and notes their permanent supranational value. The review panel does not discern existing national level research infrastructure in the Haas disciplines because it doesn't exist and does not discuss equivalent cultural humanities and social sciences collections but it does draw the reader's attention to the relevant examples such as the premier Australian Indigenous Languages and Cultural Collection held by IATSIS and the Australian English Collection and Paradisic. The Clark Review notes, in some cases, these collections are more widely dispersed than scientific collections and that the management of Haas collections is becoming increasingly national through e-research tools such as Nectar. The review panel knows it should be thinking about society and culture, but they have something else on their minds. After an intense international campaign, Australia had won the right to co-host the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array of Radio Telescopes. Now Chief Scientist Alan Finkel introduces the 2016 NCRIS roadmap by invoking Galileo. 
Now, old Galilee ground his own lenses and assembled his own little telescope and changed the world. But today, well then, 15 of the world's leading research nations were collaborating to build the SKA. It is a multinational effort to listen to the beginning of all things, the cosmic dawn. How can the humanities compete with this? Where's our telescope analogy? Galileo was certainly influenced by the philosophers and artists of Renaissance Italy. His father was a musicologist. But in Australia in 2016, where is the acknowledgement that science, and it should not need saying, is a human endeavour that benefits from the humanities disciplines? Alas, there's a glimmer of light. It seems the 2016 ANCRIS will, after all, recommend funding for the humanities. Finally, the 2016 roadmap said that ENCRIS should include platforms for humanities, arts and social sciences. Following the release of the 2016 roadmap in March 2017, the Academy of the Humanities works with colleagues at ASA and the GLAM sector and researchers to scope infrastructure platforms for HASS. We convened data summits for humanities and culture in 2018 and 2019 that were sponsored by Arnet and held at the National Film and Sound Archive, the National Library of Australia. These summits were our first major push at collective action. In fact, they were the first time representatives across HASS and GLAM sectors had come together to workshop our needs for national research infrastructure. It was agreed that humanities and cultural research was at a pivotal juncture. Changes in digital technology, big data, were transforming research practice in humanities and arts. But the threshold problem lay in the lack of an agreed approach to research infrastructure investments for humanities, arts and culture. The Academy's position was that a national strategic plan to expand the development of innovative research infrastructure and a large collaborative interconnected facility for humanities, arts and culture with a broad national remit was required. Several research infrastructure platforms were presented as case studies. Paradisic, which, was Australia, which is Australia's digital archive for endangered languages all over the world. And at the time, there were 1,149 languages represented in the collection. Trove, the National Library of Australia's much-loved research platform, which at the time was the fourth most visited government website at around 60,000 visits a day. And the Social and Cultural and Informatics platform, bringing digital expertise and humanities, arts and social sciences knowledges together at the University of Melbourne. Arising out of the summit was a shared appetite to work together on a collaborative agenda, using research infrastructure to drive knowledge exchange in Australia and internationally. There was also an idea to bring together Hass and STEM expertise in a time machine for Australia, which was conceived as a platform for deepening knowledge of 65,000 years of Australia's human and environmental history. These summits were pivotal events. They birthed the time-laid cultural map in 2020. They launched the Language Data Commons of Australia, and I acknowledge Michael Hoare is in the room today. But we still had to contend with inertia in the NCRA system. The government responded to the 2016 roadmap in the second half of 2018. It committed funding to an excellent social science platform, URIN, for urban research infrastructure, which would get $7 million. But the largest share of HASS expenditure would not go to HASS platforms at all. $43 million would go to CSIRO to build a new building for its plant and insect collections. This is under the HASS um, research uh, platforms. And the Atlas of Living Australia, which was biology based, received a further $2 million. By contrast, the humanities would receive a share of the funds allocated for scoping studies in the order of $400,000. So of the $112 million, 
that was nominally allocated to Haas for the period to 2029, the humanities could be confident of some portion of $400,000. That's less than half a percent of the total. But the funding door had been opened just to crack. And now, thanks to the humanities, cult, humanities and Culture Data Summits, we had real momentum to mount the case for further investment. The scoping studies into Haas research platforms were conducted by the ARDC and the Academy of the Humanities. The Academy focused on international comparators. We completed detailed mapping of research infrastructures in Europe, the UK, Netherlands, USA, Canada and New Zealand. The report showed that Haas in Australia was in much the same position that leading Australian nations had been in before EU stimulus ceded um, key Haas strengths. We concluded that one of the highest priorities for Australian Haas national research infrastructure was the establishment of an entity that would create focus, clarify responsibility, maximise collaboration and reduce complexity regarding Haas research infrastructures. We now have that entity, the Haas and Indigenous Research Data Commons. We're all here today to support it and to contribute to it. In 2023, as you heard from Jenny, Haas and Indigenous RDC received the largest ever investment in Haas research investment infrastructure in Australia. We are now well into the co-design process for the expansion of Haas research infrastructure. At this point, I must acknowledge the enormous personal endeavours of Haas researchers over many years, some of whom are in the room today. I'd also like to acknowledge in the room Dr John Lane, who was the chief architect of this speech, and I thoroughly enjoyed being John's research assistant while we waded through the 100,000 words for this speech. I would also like to again underscore the integral role played by Dr Kylie Brass in the Academy Secretariat, who has worked tirelessly over 15 years in building relationships, setting the vision, connecting the dots between policy and practice and cultivating the collective. I also acknowledge the enormous efforts of the team at the ARDC, especially Jenny Fuster, and the leadership team at the Academy of Social Sciences Australia. New champions for Haas research infrastructure are joining the movement and the ARDC is making great strides in building researcher capacity as well as supporting platform development. Indigenous research data sovereignty has, sovereignty has moved, rightly and at long last, to centre stage both within our academy and in our national research infrastructure initiatives. We really are just at the beginning of something that has so much to offer our disciplines and through them, the nation. Nation scale humanities research data infrastructure. What a mouthful. But what it boils down to is this, our ability not only to see further, but to bring human perspectives in all their variety, to bear upon national issues in all their complexity. That's how we can fulfil the mission for research for the social benefit. I look forward to working with you all, including through the ARDC, to that end. Thank you very much. OK, so let me start with the story. The world's people are like, I'll start again, the world's people, Bill, are like a garden of beautiful flowers. And I'm about to introduce you to the best, most beautiful flowers in the garden. <laughs> in Jennifer Fust Jen Jenny Fuster, Roberto McClellan, nephew to me, Kristen Smith and Levi Murray. And I'll be the thorn between the four roses. Yes. 
Perfect. Thank you. Going on. Um, one young Yilam, Ngai Burunga Durwan, Gorang Gorang Ngai Jan, um, Banda Munmala, uh, Belguain Ngajim La, uh, one young Bachelor, one young Waka Waka, Gorang Gorang Gabi Gabi Yiman, uh, Yilam Ngi, um, Yugumbe, Gumroi, Wiradjuri, uh, Wanyi, uh, Yilam Ngi. Importantly, I am acknowledging um, in the presence of whom I am with today, um, whilst also adhering to my cultural obligations incumbent upon myself uh, as I am off country and within the presence of both my, my matrilineal uncle and my old grandfather also. Um, I also too um, respectfully acknowledge the mobs of uh, my, my dear colleagues who collaborate and um, work this tricky journey that we do. We've got a lot of queens, they mob in the room too, which is deadly. But nevertheless, we are um, off country, and in doing so, I do want to say Ngalan Balbam Jang Ngulamu Ngai Bagai Galangan, Murundaja Ngulamu Wabangwani Ganguja Ngulamu Ngai Ngalan Balbam. Um, Jangi Waranjari Woi Warangja Kulanja Tulba Nyulam Jangi. Let me acknowledge that this is Waranjari country um, and those mob belonging to that greater Kulan area and um, um, give thanks to our brother there this morning for welcoming us here on this lovely, cool evening today. Um, with that said, we're going to have a conversation with you all, uh, a bit of a round table conversation, although we're, our tables aren't round. Um, we'll progress towards that. Um, and it's around authentic relationships and meaningful collaborations within uh, the Hass and Indigenous RDC and centering Indigenous communities, their voices, their perspectives at the heart of what we do. So I hope that we can give you a few examples of that as we progress the conversation, as well as a few key concepts that hopefully provoke a bit of thought amongst the audience um, as we progress to do that. But let me hand over to um, my lovely colleague, Jenny Fuster, to kick us off. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm not gonna introduce myself again, <laughs> um, but it was um, lovely to hear Robert speaking in his language there. I've been learning a few of their words, but I'm not going to share any of them with you today because it would be mildly inappropriate. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Goring Goring artist Dylan Sara for the Indigenous icons that you'll see in all of my slides. Um, it's great that we've got those incorporated. So I've already been through what a research data commons is this morning. Um, and I've talked about four of the projects. So just to refresh, the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project, as led by distinguished Professor Marcia Langton. Uh, the Language Data Commons of Australia, as led by Michael Hoare. Professor Michael Hoare, sorry, left that off there, Michael. Uh, we've got a social sciences stream of work, a sneak peek of our two new programs that we'll go into a bit more depth on tomorrow. So we've got the Australian Creative Histories and Futures and the Australian Internet Observatory. And as well as that, as that we have another program of work which we're calling Connections, which includes the ARDC Community Data Lab. So what do these things have in common? Um, as well as all being part of the bigger structure of the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons, all of these projects have Indigenous data. And indeed, all of our research data commons at the ARDC has Indigenous data. So in light of that, we've, we've forged some really fantastic relationships with uh, 
our Indigenous partners through the Indigenous Data Network, but also the other projects uh, who have Indigenous representation embedded within them. And as such, we've worked towards, over the last three years, you know, we've held a lot of gatherings, not just the symposium, but we have the summer school, we've had uh, round tables looking at repository structures, access and authentication. So we've touched on a broad range of topics and we've always had Indigenous representation there and we've always been interested to hear how we can help to advance Indigenous data governance across the Hassan Indigenous RDC. As such, this year we've worked, we and all of our partners actually have worked on um, a framework for governance of Indigenous data for the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons. It's a document that we're immensely proud of. It's not yet been released, um, but we hope that it will be soon. Um, and uh, so we're going to start by talking about the framework a little bit, but then we want to talk about what it means to actually have these authentic relationships. And for that, I'm going to hand over to Robert. Okay, thank you. So we did speak um, about this in our closed session yesterday, which was our partners day, we went through a little bit more thoroughly and in depth the governance of Indigenous data framework, which we had developed. Um, what I want to do with, I'm just going to introduce you to this conceptually. I mean, it's a, it's a 30 plus page document that also factors in a somewhat comprehensive or rigorous implementation um, tool because what good of, is any of this work if it's not uh, implementable by yourselves within the critical work that you're doing? So we spent a bit of time on that also. Um, but I won't take you through that now. I'm just going to give you a brief introduction of it um, in the spirit of progressing this conversation. So the first item is represented by the honeybee, uh, the native bee, at the top of um, the uh, model there. And representation is about establishing formal partnerships and sharing decision making with Indigenous Australians at all stages of the data life cycle um, to ensure their priorities are reflected in the data affecting them. So that's what that first one's about. The second one is capabilities, which focuses on improving the data related capabilities of the data practitioners and Indigenous communities to generate an increased sense of agency and confidence to engage within data-related management and decision-making processes throughout all stages of the data life cycle. The third aspect of the governance model is around self-determination and supporting the self-determination of Indigenous peoples when engaging with data throughout all stages of the data life cycle. It's also about developing straightforward methods for Indigenous peoples to know what data are held uh, relating to their interests how it can be accessed, and also it's about providing increased usability and analytical skills. Uh, the fourth one is around building an Indigenous data ecosystem. And this one looks at fostering organisational and cultural change to enhance the inclusion of Indigenous Australians in data governance processes and bodies really around setting a positive example. And I talk about the organisational and cultural change that may um, extend upwards and downwards both ways. It may be stemming in from your projects, up through your institutions that you're working with and beyond into your partner institutions. So there's quite, um, well, it's very evident that it's something that requires systemic change, um, particularly around the systemic challenges that we're gearing this up to combat. But none of this really works unless it's predicated on a solid uh, foundation that, uh, in terms of relationships. So unless you can do that key bit, I think uh, many projects will struggle to actually implement the framework in, 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 its true, in the true essence of which uh, it's intended. So that's what today's conversation is about. 
Um, I want to share with you around um, this conversation around people, purpose and data, building, um, building off the work of Carol Russo, uh, as we, we're all very familiar of, uh, with the FAIR principles, but the response, uh, a global response of interna uh, international uh, practitioners in the Indigenous data space developed the care principles, which we um, work, we, we uh, marry those two together, fair and care, implementing them in unison. So there was a um, international workshop in about 2018, and as part of that, the delegates concluded that of these existing frameworks, um, many, uh, all of them, you know, were oriented towards data, people and purpose. So three key areas there. Now, while both Indigenous and mainstream principles identified the data-centric principles, such as the ones that we, we are familiar with when we talk about FAIR, uh, the Indigenous frameworks emphasised people and purpose-oriented principles. So I just wanted to stress that point because it does feature a lot within our framework, people, purpose and um, data oriented principles in terms of conceptualising it. Also too, I want to share with you, I like this um, little guide that was developed by Mayam Nari Wingara, um, who were talking about what is Indigenous data governance and what is it not. And I like the first one, Indigenous data governance is not an Indigenous data advisory panel or other such body. Um, so it just sort of goes through some of those things in terms of really breaking down. I'm not going to read through those things, but I'm going to take this um, moment to maybe touch on two things. I guess the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons really has a role in fostering and developing greater competencies around Indigenous data governance and Indigenous data generally within the research communities and the extended communities upon which we all connect with. I also want to mention, and we do talk about it in our framework, we referenced the Productivity Commission um, who did the national, uh, the review of the national agreement on the closing the gap, which has already been referenced once or twice uh, this morning. And it's an, a pretty integral piece of work that um, impacts a lot of the work that we do and our communities. Now this report revealed the governance reforms, uh, the government's reforms were not, sorry, I'll start again. And the reforms that were set out originally in the national agreement on the closing the gap were not prioritised by governments. And that was explicitly stated within the review, the Productivity Commission's review. And upon many of our Indigenous communities and perhaps mob in the room, today, that will be of no surprise to you because we were working out in that space during that period of time. It also, um, uh, the report also underscored the critical need for robust Indigenous data governance frameworks. While Indigenous data sovereignty principles are vital, prioritising governance mechanisms can effectively translate those sovereignty ideals into actionable strategies for Indigenous communities. The report detailed the following findings. They said that the commitment to shared decision making is rarely achieved in practice. They said that government policy doesn't reflect the value of the community controlled sector. They said that the transformation of government organisations has barely begun, uh, that govern governments are not enabling Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander led data. They also said that performance reporting provides only a partial picture of progress. And finally, that accountability for developing, uh, for delivering on the commitments in the agreement is lacking. And I think those are very key, um, key points to our conversation today and tomorrow perhaps also. In addition, the review recommends additional commitments uh, to further drive change, recognising Indigenous data sovereignty as a cornerstone. The recommendations advocate for bolstering Indigenous data governance. Certainly, this is something that we see as our initial steps forward in when, when we talk about that, building an Indigenous data ecosystem. We know the condition um, of Indigenous data at the moment. 
it is not in a condition where we can flick a switch and assert data sovereignty and it just happens. We need to do the work. And the only way to get to that stage progressionally is to build up greater competencies around Indigenous data governance. So that is where we're investing our time, effort and energy to help communities, research communities, Indigenous communities, institutions, etc., to do that critical work that needs to be done. I've said enough on that. I'm going to invite Uncle Grant up now, who's going to talk through some of these slides. So, um, I'll just ad lib. Um, in order to build cultural competence, well, co competency, we've got to understand how the past affects the present. And um, that's an interesting slide there in itself to recognise what we're talking about. In Australia, we're only talking about 236 years of existence as of this year. We're still young. I was saying to Uncle Mike at Little Lunch, you know, for Australian society, there's a, a certain portion of power that wants to maintain the status quo. They'd be quite happy for us either to die out, and this is a reality, don't be shocked by this, just die out and become non-existent, or they'd be happy for us to just become assimilated into this westernised system. And neither of those options are options that we consider fair or equitable. When you talk about principles, you talk about fair, care and, care and fair. If you don't care, it's not going to be fair. And at this point, and I'll be brutally honest, if you don't care, up until this point, it hasn't been really fair. And you've heard that through, you know, people have closed in the gap but paternalistically, it's not held accountable to productivity measures or socioeconomic targets progress forward. If closing the gap, and I'll be honest about it, if they were a business, they would have been out of business five years ago. And that's reality. Data commons and valuing respecting Indigenous people's data, you cannot expect a champagne outcome by providing a homebrew budget. That's reality. Everybody in this room actually is here because you do care. You're genuinely interested in trying to revolutionise change. What I said to Uncle Mike was, if you don't want to listen to us as the people, start having a look at the animals and see what they're telling you because that's what we learn from. Start having a look at the environment and how it's changing. That's what we learned, and that's what you need to learn. And the other thing I'll say is that part of the story of fair and care is valuing and respecting who we all are in terms of our ancient humanity. We all connect back to humanity. Australia's only been in existence for 236 years as we know it today, and there's a map of Europe to show the countries that have been colonised. Ours is one. And it's been colonised as part of Westminster system. To my brother from Sri Lanka, yeah? We had a yarn at Little Lunch. You're here, you're welcome in this country, yeah? Today you're on Wurundjeri country. That's the level of engagement we have to establish. Your family's my family, your law is my law. If I go to Ebony in Palawa, same. I'm a little boy in your country. Okay, same. This little boy, we've got to develop that level of cultural understanding, competency and capability. And that's what we've got to go to. Now, if we look at that map, keep that in mind, and we, we've seen this one before. Oh, what's going on here? This is going the wrong way, Robert. Now, people have seen that before. In Portugal, they have this U-Butte Data Commons framework. And we're just going to go from Portugal and going to roll it out in Poland. What's the problem with that? No, they're, they're people, they're humans. They've just heard what I talked about. We're all part of humanity. What's the difference? What's the problem there? Sometime today would be lovely. This is real, hey? So what do you reckon they're different people? 
No, nah, that it would work in Australian terms. That'd be probably four or five hour trip by plane. Language, but they're human beings. Why don't they speak all the same language, English? <laughs> Somebody help this poor woman. Yeah. <laughs> What's the problem? You're saying it's distance. So let's go then into Germany and get them to sort out the data conversations and get the historical truth telling happening for the Polish people. What's the problem there? Yeah? What sort of experiences? Come on, somebody help. What's the problem? We've gone close and out of Germany. Hey? No, we stuff Portugal, they're finished. We've, we've gone. <laughs> We're now in Germany, I'm in Germany, yeah. and we're going to c cross over into Poland. They're different cultures with different histories. So they're different Man, uh, that's like Ukraine and Russia. That's like Palestine and, yeah? Yeah, it's Why don't people get this, this basic common sense? What's the history of German and Poland? Hey? Well, they're, they're, you're saying there's trauma that we've got to understand. Why don't we understand that? Common sense. 100 years from this day, you're not going to be here. We need to actually make sense of this now and move forward. If you can't understand and don't want to understand and listen to what we're saying, have a look at the animals. Take note of the environment because that's telling us something. Mother Nature's watching all this and she'll throw all this shit out without us, with or without us. But anyway, how do we move this next slide, Robert? I'm going to, hey? Big button. Big button. So you can see the problems with that previous slide. Palawa, they're down the bottom. I noticed one of your slides, Jenny, with that box with the squares of Australia, there's no Torres Strait. Yeah? But they're also part of this conversation. So given the Portuguese situation, how can one of those people there speak for all another people? I mentioned to Inga this morning that the term Aborigine is pseudo-scientific Latinized term to define all of us as one. 250 different languages, 700 plus dialects. I'm just a little boy on her country. And yet you hear me talk constantly about embracing our sense of cultural honour, integrity, dignity, humility. In order to address what we're going to do in the next hundred years, we've got to understand how our past affects our present. And we need to do that beyond fear, denial, guilt or blame. Nobody in this room is at fault for what I'm talking about, but we need to draw a line in the sand and make sense of it. Because without that, we're not going to get anywhere. Yep. Um, these people here, all connected, and I use the Chukapa, Central Desert, time of creation story that talks about the natural world, the physical world, the sacred world. And those are the things that kept all things in balance and harmony. Now the term chukapa changes, but the three common themes are the land, the people, the environment. If you don't take care of the land and the environment, they're not going to take care of us, the humans. And that's what we're not getting. Those three worlds have got to be in balance and harmony. Now when we look at the 236 years of Europe, British invasion, and I'll use the word invasion, people get fearful of that. The country was invaded. Genocide was committed. Own it, understand it. You didn't cause it. Tell the truth and move beyond that, beyond fear, denial, guilt and blame. And you can Google what genocide's about and you'll see it happened here and it happened in different other parts of the world. As a result of that invasion, the impacts on that physical, sacred and human world changed. And with that, it changed the cultural psychology and the sociology of who we were and who we are now. Earlier you heard about smartphones. I heard about a love child. I don't know what that was about, but... <laughs> but the language, the psychology, the sociology has changed. What people in Australia need to realise is that Aboriginal people have their own psychology and it's vastly different to what 
Western psychologists have talked about. We have our own sociology. We've been socialised to think and feel and behave differently. And sadly, because of the advent of um, British history, we've been oppressed. And that's where you have trauma, you have lateral violence, you have factionalism. Throw in things like native title. Where did we go? We went from straight out massacres, poison waterholes, flour, sugar, tea. We then went into the preservation of Aborigines and restriction of sale of Opium Act in Queensland, which is the precursor to the uh, South, Australia, uh, South, South African apartheid. Understand the past in order to better understand our present. And then we moved into assimilation, self-determination, closing the gap, or oh, hang on, preceding that, reconcil reconciliation, closing the gap, and I'm waiting for the next thing. I'm waiting for the next thing to roll out. Because one day soon, somebody's going to say, oh, this closing the gap stuff, it's not really accountable. And when we talk about governance, governance is about performance and accountability primarily. So we're talking about data governance, and yet there's a lot of effort that's been put into a conversation around data governance, but it'll get to a point, and let me tell you, you hear about the glass ceiling? Well, there's a steel concrete ceiling that's going to say, put your data governance back in the box, along with your fare and your care, and shut up, because we're quite happy to maintain the status quo. That's your reality. What we've got to do is persist. It's a journey that we've got to go through, and that journey has fundamentally got to change the way we think, feel and behave as Australian people. We're privileged to be on the lands of one of the oldest continuous living cultures in the world. We've got to appreciate what that means. In a Western government context, this is what your standard public policy process is. Clearly define the problem, consider the solutions that, um, the issues that surround the problem, develop solutions based on time, quality, cost, money, accountability, and choose a course of action. In art in the country, Alice Springs, they could sit down and do a problem analysis the same, and they'll formulate a policy response and direction. They'll develop strategic planning documents and all the infrastructure they need around that. Every six to 10 years, they'll review it and start it again. 43 years I spent in this game, and there's people in this room that have spent more I've got a degree in public sector management politics, and this here makes sense to an extent. But if you meld that framework with traditional law, where a problem or issue presents in any community, it will create this, disharmony and imbalance. That's what's happening in Aranda and all different communities around our country. If these people, the policy makers, go and actually sit, listen and learn with a sense of honour and integrity and dignity and humility to the old people in those local communities, those lo old people will tell you the problem based on our locally informed, culturally informed, trauma informed knowledge is this. And these are the issues that contribute to these problems. The next conversation you have is what are the solutions? And they'll tell you what the solutions are and they will choose a course of action. Standard process. So we're just not getting it. So when we look at it in that cultural context, the model's there, and we can meld it with cultural ways of knowing and modern ways of doing. But it has to be locally informed, culturally informed, historically informed, trauma informed, and healing focused. If you want to humanise, culturalise, revolutionise, fair and care, there's a framework for you, moulded with Western ways of knowing and doing, with cultural ways of knowing and doing. And that would apply in Sri Lanka too. Same thing. You catch them on a picture, your law is my law. Same. If we're going to understand the present, we have to take the time to understand the past. We're only talking about 236 years, and I often ask, coming to these forums, I often ask myself, how much data have we accumulated in that 236 years? And what's important and what's not important? 
but what do we need to do as Australian people? And I'll say it again, people who are born here, you belong here. Start to own that. Understand what that means. You've got the same obligations to take care of this land and this environment as we do. To people who are not born here, you're very welcome in this country. And today you're on Wurundjeri country. And that's something you must always understand. Your values are the same as our values. And I've talked about the psychology and who we are. But where do you fit? And what's your role? And what's your purpose? What's the matter, Simon? You look tired. You, you all right? It's hard to be handsome all the time, isn't it? <laughs> So my, the moral of my story, I guess, and I'm pressing the wrong buttons here. Sorry. Robert? There's no back. Um, if you're going to make progress moving forward, you've got to have to, you're going to have to put the past into present perspective. And part of that story is just move beyond fear, denial, guilt or blame. And we've got a lot to learn and share. And one of the things I said to Inga this morning was that while we procrastinate and don't really understand the fear and the care, we're actually holding back a whole healing process that can happen globally. And that comes down to basic things like caring, sharing and respect for the land, the people, the environment. Yeah. Um. There's only two buttons on this thing. <laughs> In the interest of time, though, I do just want to quickly um, run through... I won't say too much about it. Just the, the point about this slide is it's an example of how at LDACA we have, um, as we're predominantly concerned with people data, um, we acknowledge that there are, you know... Um, we're working with material that has been collected historically in, in ways that we'd consider unethical today, right? So that brings about a whole series of complexities. We're also dealing with data that's been decontextualised, miscontextualised, misinterpreted, um, and described in really not effective ways. So we're working I mean, through yeah. that. We're also at the point of collection. This material, in many instances, has been collected from communities and and some folk who have been um, dispossessed of their land or might be on different country or... Um, so, so there's there's so many... There's a whole array of different cultural complexities and data complexities of which we have to work through um, when we're working with Indigenous communities and Indigenous data. The important part of, of this diagram was really just the way we conceptualise data, tools and training and the aspects that underpin that but the purpose of this um, model was just to say that with everything that we have done with LDACA, we are always reminded of the fact that it is people data we are dealing with and people are at the centre of what we are doing. And that was echoed, well, I'm echoing it now, but it was said earlier today. Um, so we continue to work in, in that sort of space. Um, I just want to share this too as perhaps another little guide. Again, this sort of builds on that Simon Sinek um, stuff around uh, the, um, I've gone blank, around the, the golden circles. The, why, the why, the how and the what, yes. And um, so Google that because I won't tell you now. But at the centre of that is really around the why. Why do we exist? Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, and that's why purpose is at the centre of it, but maintaining a reciprocal governance model oriented around transparency, accountability and participation. And the challenge I put to everyone in the room is how do you do? How do you do reciprocal governance? How do you do both ways accountability? In many instances, we have done a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, we have done a lot of the work in terms of... Um, supporting Indigenous data governance reform, we've carried it the full way across. We're still waiting on the effective response in return from various, um, you know, government groups, as Uncle Grant said before, take the care, take the fair, the Indigenous governance, sit down and shut up. We've been told that and we've still progressed, we still persist because we're doing what is right, 
for community. We're doing what is right for our, our area of work because we're exposed to that. And if you know better, then you have to do better. And that's the commitment that we make. So my challenge to you all is to consider how are you doing reciprocal governance when you s form those relationships with communities, when they give you their valuable data, their time, their energy to consult, they're over-consulted, over-studied, tired, burdened. When they give you that time, how are you, in the spirit of reciprocity, meeting them halfway and not expecting mob to go the full way and then reject whatever is at the end? Because that's what we've gone through and it would burn a lot of people out. So we're trying to fix those. That's clear? We're trying to set that right. So that's my challenge for you. We might come back to that slide. Again, this is just another useful, simple tool that helped us at LDAC in terms of basic, basic principles of engagement, inform, consult, or how do you then take the leap and become more in, um, a more involved engagement process around involvement and collaboration. And then we just reconceptualize this um, into a bit of a matrix. And all this demonstrates is that where you are working in the involve and collaborate space, you're getting a better return, right? But naturally it is, it's a higher organisational impact and it's a higher level of complexity, but certainly well worth the return. Um, I'm going to, before we go to conversation, I'm going to hand to my colleagues, Kristen and, and Levi. Um, do you want to come? Okay, so we're just going to talk to you a little bit about the development of one of the partnerships that has developed over the course of the work on the in Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project. But before that, I'd better quickly introduce ourselves. So my name's Kristen Smith. I'm the Research Director of the Indigenous Studies Unit and the Indigenous Data Network at the University of Melbourne. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Levi Murray. I'm the Strategic Manager of Indigenous Data at the Indigenous Studies Unit. So I work alongside Associate Professor Christine and also our distinguished Professor Marcia Langton as well. So to give a little bit of context about the development of the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities um, project, look, it did not emerge out of thin air. Marcia has been working in this space and um, doing a lot of work in advocacy for years and years um, prior to the emergence of the funding schemes and all the rest. I still remember probably had to be at least seven or eight years prior to the emergence of this funding scheme, she was heading off to Canberra and having meetings about that. There were people coming down to the university having meetings with Marcia and others about this type of work and the importance of it. Yeah. So it hasn't just emerged from nowhere, as we heard earlier. There's been a lot of people over a long period of time to get us to where we are now. Can I just yeah, dovetail please do. in? And I, and I think, you know, um, it, it's, so, it's so pertinent that, you, you know, we acknowledge that. We often get up and we start by opening, you know, all of our presentations, all of our gatherings by doing an acknowledgement of country. What, what does any of that mean if we're not actually acknowledging the work in the actual appropriate timeline? And so it's no disrespect to, you know, the timeline that was put forward this morning from Inga and your presentation, which was fabulous, by the way. However... Respectfully, that work has been going on since I was like still in school. <laughs> when we were talking about in university, it was like when I was in high school. It was like, it's yeah, it doesn't just pop up overnight. The work has been eternal. It's been long. It's laborious, and it's emotionally laborious as well. So you know, I I I, I do it, I, I do want to acknowledge the work that's you know in the level of investment that it's taken to get to that point. And I guess to that point, one of the things that we really knew that we had to do when we were developing this project was to ensure that it was going to be of most and utmost benefit to the communities across Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities that we've been working with for years, that Professor Langton has been working with for, you know, better part of four decades. Um, I've been working with Professor Marcia Langton for, I think I've worked at it, must be about 13 or 14 years now, um, since I was finalising my PhD. We've worked in communities I've, across Australia, in the majority of jurisdictions on a variety of different topics. My training's in medical anthropology. 
um, throughout our time, particularly in the years leading up to the development of the Indigenous Data Network. Um, we spent a lot of time working with the Aboriginal community controlled sector, again, with multiple organisations in different ju jurisdictions. And one element that came up time and time again, and again was the inability of communities themselves to get access to the data that they desperately wanted and needed, that particularly administrative government bodies across Australia were collecting about them and not sharing back with them. Um, we know that it's eventuated as one of the priority reforms in the Closing the Gap um, Partnership Agreement, looking at ensuring that communities get access to this data that has been collected about them for so much time. Again, we haven't progressed very far in this, this endeavour, despite the commitment of governments across all jurisdictions of Australia. However, people across Australia do understand the need and the importance, and I think all of us here in the room do. Um, so I guess moving forward on from that, we knew that the work that we were doing in the Improving Indigenous Research Data Commons had to be based in community experience, community need, community wants and priorities. So as we were developing it, we knew that we needed to actually work with a range of different groups across Australia. As has been discussed before by Grant, no, we know very well that no one community is the same. We've Everybody has different needs, different expectations. And in order for a research data commons to work for all people across Australia, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups, you can't just look at one community group, for example, here in Melbourne. You can't just look at one extremely remote community group. You cannot look at just one jurisdiction. You need to go far more broadly than that. Um, the work that we are doing one of the case studies, one of the many case studies in the project that we have been undertaking so far, has been quite a, a rich partnership that has been developed specifically for this project, really only a, across these couple of years. But the work that our colleagues and Marcia has been doing up in northeast Arnhem Land has been for decades. Um, I first was invited up to Yakala, to the Yakala um, Bilingual School several years ago by Professor Yelme Yunapingu, who is now the Senior Australian of the Year, because she had significant concerns about the work she had been undertaking within the bilingual school and the, the resources, bilingual resources that had been developed by herself, other community members, clan leaders, and all of the indigenous knowledge that had been embedded within the resources in their archive. Um, Really, there was no clear understanding of IP, ICIP issues. Um, there had been instances where she felt that there had been researchers coming in and utilising some of this material. Um, and she was really concerned about the research ethics and data governance around these issues. So after going up and, and speaking with Yelme about this, we determined that for a number of reasons, the archive that wasn't just full of this very, very rich educational um, resources with Yungu knowledge that had been developed over 50 years. It was also full of maps, um, audiovisual material in all sorts of formats uh, with a, a range of, I think it's over 5,000 photos dating back to the early 30s, some of which um, Donald Thompson had taken back in the early 30s and others. It, it's an archive of national significance and what we also realised is that the state of where it was being housed was extraordinarily problematic and the archive is and remains full of black mould. The urgency to digitise this and we know that this is not just in Yakala, not just this archive, it is across different communities across Australia, it urgently needed digitisation. It was a community priority they also wanted a way to make sure that they could continue to access this material in ways that aligned with their local governance models. There is material in that archive from 13 different clan groups and there was also a need expressed by different community leaders led by Yelme, Professor Yelme Yunapingu 
um, that they needed some sort of Yongu data governance principles and framework to sit across the archive, both the digital material that we're creating and the physical material within there. So I'll move it along, but we, we've been up there, we've brought um, interns from the University of Melbourne, volunteers from across Australia, we've done training with local young, mainly young women who are wanting to get into the archive and make sure that it is preserved and maintained for both their generation and generations to come. This is not a short-term relationship, this relationship will be ongoing. It's a very important thing that people don't go into communities with solutions, mm -hmm. say, I'm coming in to research you. This is a mistake that has been made over and over again. Ensuring that you're working with communities in a way that prioritises their needs is essential. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. I thought that was the best one since, since we started, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also thought we're doing it tomorrow. No, we are doing something else tomorrow. Oh, no, not again. <laughs> uh, questions. Don't be offended by the, um, the passion in which we express ourselves. We're all passionate about this. Um, so don't feel fearful or anything like that. We're not going to snap your head off. Are there any questions that you'd like to present? Tom, Tom, turn around. Um, but I'm wondering if we could, uh, if, if we could hear, like how particularly the IDN is currently describing um, ID, uh, Indigenous data to get a sense of uh, the wording that you're using to describe that, because um, I think one of our central challenges is communicating the difference between a naive interpretation of that label, yeah, and uh, like the, the one of the core challenges of communicating just how broad the scope is. Absolutely, Levi. <laughs> Oh. Have we got that definition? So what? Yeah. Can we get that? I think um, Robert's finding the exact we, wording. Is that right? I Robert? think Robert's. Oh, let me just talk into this microphone. <laughs> We've got the um. We, we'll just. Okay, it's two to, paragraphs, want, so yeah. you can forgive Levi for not being able to whilst, recite it off yeah. the top of his head. Um, whilst they pull up and look for that definition um, in its exact wording, um, it's a very good question. But what I want to talk about when we talk about data is, you know, what we don't have a conversation nearly enough about, or the idea, or the concept, data, if it is an asset, right? Data itself is much like any other asset, water, land, all of that other stuff, right? Um, we understand the concept for, you know, Indigenous peoples when we talk about their rights to those assets, that they're inalienable and they're inextricable like that. Um, same thing just needs to be applied with data in that sense, that it is an inalienable asset to peoples, Indigenous peoples in particular. But the exact wording, I'll hand it over to Robert. Um, the, okay, data generated intentionally or not by, about or for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Indigenous data refers to information in any format or medium collected, analysed, stored and interpreted within the context of Indigenous individuals, collectives, populations, entities, life waves, waves, life ways, cultures, knowledge systems, lands, biodiversity, water and other resources. It includes data collected, used or stored by any agency, department, laboratory, organisation, corporate, corporation, statutory body, <coughs> university or research institute conducted by, with and about Indigenous peoples and data and Indigenous communities have generated and maintained themselves. Have we missed anything? 
it's a very, very, um, the reason why we ended up granulating that right down to an atomic level is so that one, there is no ambiguity, and two, that it is a real distinct call for people to actually participate in this. When we talk about, you know, Indigenous data governance and, you know, ideals of sovereignty, it's one thing to, to set about those in call for principles, but, you know, the challenge has always been how is it that you operationalise something? <coughs> How is it that you get people to come out of, you know, habitual ways of working or knowing and doing? And, you, you know, one of the things that we've seen thus far over the first three years of the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project is a lot of the, um, the, the leading conversations when we're talking to institutes and across, you know, different custodians is the fact that, you know, they'll often be the first, one of the first conversations, oh, but there's a law or legislation or there's a policy or a procedure that, you know, prevents this. It's just like, okay... Why, why aren't you challenging that? Why don't you do that work? It's not my job. <laughs> um, so one of the things is, is when and they, people say, oh, well, you know, this is about, say, for um, one of the examples is, oh, but this is about um, land and planet sciences. Uh, we don't know if we've got Indigenous data. Ridiculous. Because if you're looking at land sciences in Australia, in the context of Australia, every bit of data is relative to mob. <laughs> So, you know, we wanted to be explicit in the definition so people don't have a, a way. It's accountability mechanism, really, the definition. It's, there, there is no way that you should not be participating or that you should not be cognizant or at least at the very minimum thinking how is it that in, Indigenous data is embedded or where does it sit, what's it look like? You could add um, how all of that data through story is linked to song, ceremony, dance and art in its purest form. Um, and to recognise the diversity of stories, particularly um, as you're talking then, Levi, the, the bird, the willy wagtail bird, people are familiar with the willy wag, chitter chitter, to some people he messenger for death, to other people he gossip bird. To other people, he's there for a very important message. He's a messenger bird, but he has different meaning. And all of those Aboriginal groups, they're all different dialects. The same as um, uh, Capito Inga, the Italiano, but different dialect to my father's ancestry. We, we have to understand Australia is just a young nation in what we understand, but we're born, privileged to be on ancient lands. So the sooner we invest in that, embracing the ancient ways of knowing and the modern ways of doing, the better it will be. Any cool. questions, um, Nicola, from the... Yes, Maggie. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for a really um, excellent session. Uh, it was really illuminating. Thank you. My question is, in the context of the size of the work you are doing, how do you prioritise? How do you work out what the next step is um, as, as the process unfolds? Because, yeah, I'd just be really interested to hear how you think about that. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues in a minute, but I think that that's a great question and I think that it highlights the fact that we can't just expect our Indigenous colleagues to take the burden of doing all of the work and the rest of us have to step up and support them. Um, um, but I'll say there's a, a good argument there back and forth about, well, in one instance, we do have to prioritise because we're limited by resources, right? By definition, that's what we we'll need to do. Who are we to prioritise when there's so many diverse communities and diverse community needs? Um, the, the intricate balance that we sort of find in terms of the work we do with LDACA is really hands-on, but also to, uh, as you spread across the different priorities, we're hands-on working with data and collections, but we're also working with those responsible for it and building their capabilities, skills, training, that kind of thing, and which is why that need for capabilities has featured so prominently in our governance model. 
and contributing back to that data ecosystem because it's we as as Jenny says we we simply can't do it all no. by ourselves. Did you want to go? Oh, no, you go first, and then I'll jump in. I was just going to say, the project that we've been building is the most, is the largest, and it grows larger every day. Yeah. There's no way of constraining it. There is so much need for it. The more we scratch the surface, the more we see. It's emerging, you know, well, we've had really, I guess, two distinct phases already leading up to now. We've got another four years ahead of us, but it's extraordinarily exploratory. So, of course, we're going to be finding more every day. And yes, it's extraordinarily under-resourced for the work that actually needs to be done. So, Jenny mentioned earlier, really, I think it needs to be its own standalone NCRIS, pla NCRIS facility. facility. Um, I, I don't see any other way of continuing this work in a way that it is actually going to have the real impact on the ground that we all know is needed. Again, it doesn't just cut across the Haas disciplines. There's Indigenous data across every single disciplinary area. It's not just in research data. We know this as well. It's very difficult to, again, in our project, even to draw the line between what we should be looking at as research data what is you know, distinctly administrative data, which we should be able to do, but there is a blurred line. Um, to kind of zero in on a specific part of the question that you asked about how is it that you prioritise, right, competing interests, how do you triage that? It's a very good question. Um, it's not a cop-out, but I always say the idea that you have to be pluralistic and entertain two things at once. And simultaneously, one of the one of the ways that we are able to progress stuff and, you know, particularly at the speed and at the volume that we have over the last three years is extraordinary. When you take a second to actually look at, you know, the international relationships, the level of work and investment that we've done. Um, but that's been done from the goodwill of other people within our other sister projects across the, the uh, data commons. But what we're finding is that this idea that, you know, it's not just the responsibility of Indigenous peoples. It's like there are absolutely conversations that non-Indigenous peoples can be having that I'm not afforded. Even at the most senior space where I sit within this role, within this body of work, I'm still restricted having conversations. And yet non-Indigenous colleagues can walk in there and are able to move things. That's your job. If I can't get stuff done, then that's your job. That's where you find work to do. That's where you find like your space in this whole like work. Because it's challenging. That part's the exhausting part. Like Robert and Jenny highlighted through their portion of the presentation, we've done so much like of laying foundational work. It actually really is, you know, the goodwill of everyone else now. Um, and, you know, we run the risk, too, of people not actually participating. So, you know, beyond the, you know, the collective groups that we've, you know, been primarily engaging with, we actually need everyone to come online right now to actually start, like, rolling and operationalising, because that's the other thing, right? You, it, it, it's good, um, theoretically, but if it just stays in a level of abstraction, it has a risk of falling over before it starts. So. Mm. Nicola. 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 Thanks. Um, so Jane Simpson online asks, um, arising from the discussion of the Yakala bilingual education digitisation brings up the question of knowing what has been digitised and where it is so as not to reduplicate effort and bringing them together in accessible ways. Uh, for example, the Living Archive of Aboriginal Languages digitised nearly 4,000 books from NT Department of Education bilingual books. Um, but when libraries and archives NT took over the site, they were unable to keep the interface, which made the material readily searchable by language. So, how does the IIRC address this lack of longevity of access? Oh, yeah. yeah, so as Jenny's just whispered, <laughs> 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 
not so quietly, probably you all heard in the microphone. Um, really, it's not just about open access of material. I just put that on the table to begin with. A lot of the stuff that we will be grappling with and have been grappling with is looking at the variety of access. Who should have access? Who should be the custodian? It's always down to the communities who own, control and create the data in the first instance. Well, that's how it should be. So that's the work, some of the work we are doing. Of course, there are issues of um, replication. There are ad hoc catalogues across Australia. There are data repositories everywhere. We know the state of Indigenous data, and not just Indigenous data, might I mention, across Australia is quite abysmal. <laughs> One of the major parts of the work that we have started building the foundations for is a National Indigenous Data Catalogue. We won't hold the data itself, but we aim to start bringing together metadata of significant Indigenous data collections from all over the country to at least be findable, discoverable in one location. Again, this is not something we can achieve on our own. When we're in the context of the project we're doing, we talk about five different custodians of Indigenous data, which we'll talk about after lunch in a bit more detail. But it's a massive proposition. We do have many, many wonderful partner organisations working with us across the community controlled sector, other universities, a range of different groups, a growing list of, of investigators and project team members, but it's not enough. In order to start thinking through these, these bigger issues, we need to consolidate. We can't all be running off in different directions, doing ad hoc pieces of work here and there, or else it's futile and we'll continue on in the way we have in the past where things are lost. People cannot ever rediscover data that may have been conducted within their community. I know even as a researcher from the University of Melbourne, sometimes you'll go to a community and they say, oh, some of the University of Melbourne people were here six months ago or yesterday. They've collected a whole lot of data. There are huge issues in this area that we need to work out and it needs to be a collaborative approach. And, oh, oh, yeah, sorry, I think one of the other things is too, uh, one of the qualifiers on that or a comment around that is, because um, I'm just reading the comment back on the chat, also as far as triaging and about prioritising stuff, well it's not us that dictates that, it's actually the community, so in the first instance it's to, you know, be mighty cognizant that the community is priority. What they've highlighted is one, digitising it, um, but then two is actually putting like really strong um, governance like uh, protocol around that before we even get into the conversation of access. Um, it's a good conversation, and again, that's not a cop out, but that is the priority. We haven't actually bridged or looked at that yet. So yeah, I just don't have an answer for that, but I guess that is something that'll happen within the next phase of the work that we're doing. Um, yeah. There's a definition for reconciliation, and I'm not, I'm not here nor there for reconciliation, but it's a biblical one of all things. But it said, and this is something to consider in the context of data commons. Bring back into unity, harmony, or agreement what has been alienated. What you, the challenge for you is what, is what has been alienated in the indigenous data space. Bring back into unity, harmony or agreement what has been alienated. The agreement part's easy, Jen, that's the charter. And what you just asked for is for everybody to get on the same page and you have a one page charter to say this is what we're about. This is why, how and what we're about. Thank you very much for these lovely peoples for their presentation. Before we go to big lunch, I'm just mindful, Des, gay, and Michael, did you want to say anything from your own perspectives very quickly in relation to what was just discussed? Start with you, handsome, Des. I'm just respecting the diversity of voices in this room. Very quickly, though. I oh, know, I thought it was great to get that overview and um, that Indigenous governance and, that, and 
um, especially your comment, Grant, at the start, that being mindful of the different communities and the diversity, the different needs that we all have, how do we, how do we come up with a framework that, uh, that addresses all of that, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, and thanks everyone for the information and ideas today. Just uh, throw into the mix, I think one of the challenges in this work is often that Indigenous data is mixed up with non-Indigenous data and negotiating how to get both through those things to give due respect to the Indigenous data is a really tricky area that um, needs a lot of work and thought. So it's great that people are delving into this. So thank you. Right over there, then. I'm testing you, I am. Here we go. <laughs> That's his rap name, by the way. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've just been... Something that appears every now and again from some institutions is the concept that all cultural material held in institutions, all data, has been stolen. So I just wonder, is that productive to start on a basis that everything is stolen rather than a conversation about actually what has been stolen, what has been taken inappropriately, and what should be in these institutions. Thank you. And that's uh, to be considered in the context and fair comment. And thank you, Mark. OK, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to recycle Levi and Kristen to talk about improved Indigenous research capability, achievements and outcomes. We could have started off by um, saying Kristen and Levi, but it's always me, I Uncle Graham. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is that up on the screen? Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. So yeah, just before we kick off again, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations whose lands that we're joining on, paying my respect to their elders past and present, and also uh, emerging leaders in their respective communities across the Kulin Nations as well. Um, I'd also like to extend that to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that might be joining, be they in the room, online, or in the future as well, in viewing this, uh, uh, this day back. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of you who are familiar with myself, unfortunately. Um, I, I, work as part of the oh, I work as a strategic manager as a part of the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project. Uh, we've been functioning and operating since uh, 2021, uh, projects to start. Time's uh, kind of an evasive thing at the moment. Just uh, feel like the last few years have just galloped away. So it's always a bit of a challenge to try and remember where the starting point was. So yeah, one of the things that we wanted to uh, present and go over today is looking at uh, what we've achieved and what some of those outcomes have been over the past three years. Sorry, I was more organised before. So, just to give you an overview, the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project. Um, in the first iteration of this uh, project, we were really focused on setting down some of the foundations. And as you would have heard over the last uh, two days, um, the project um, ha has been centrally focused at improving the capabilities of Indigenous uh, research. But laying the foundations also meant that we need to have better understandings of Indigenous research communities across Australia, um, a better understanding of the Indigenous data across um, also, a better understanding of the Indigenous data across Australia, development of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research data catalogue, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data rematriation and data repository and storage options, technical architecture and tooling uh, being built cross-sectorial Indigenous data capabilities, 
and also laying foundations for training and education to build Indigenous research data, uh, data capabilities across the nation. So, as we mentioned before, oh, sorry. as we mentioned, the project uh, is primarily focused on supporting five communities of Indigenous custodians. They are the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community control organisations, universities, researchers and other research bodies, the GLAM sector, which is galleries, libraries, archives and museums, uh, Commonwealth, state, territory and local governments, and as well as the private sector. Um, as we mentioned in the last presentation, this really has been a growing project. Um, we started with a much smaller list of both investigators and project partners and other contributors. Some have left, a lot more have been added to the list. So it's been very, very encouraging. And I was just talking with Sandra just before we stepped up here about one of the most encouraging things about doing this work has been the collaboration that is occurring across all sorts of, well, all different sectors whether it's univer different universities coming together, um, a range of different community controlled organisations. Um, we've been working initially with a, one Indigenous business, but looking to expand that across all of the different areas of Indigenous data custodians. So it, it's been very encouraging the way that people are open to collaborating when we are doing work that hasn't really got any framework or rules, apart from more standard international ones, we're developing it on the go. So it's been fantastic, the interdisciplinarity of it, the and just the encouragement from everyone. It's been very exciting work to be endeavouring on. Now, initially, we, start, we started the project uh, with very much sort of smaller scope and different areas and streams of work packages, looking specifically at, at social infrastructure, technical infrastructure, and then more of the geospatial lens. As we've continued across this, you know, two and a half, nearly three years, we've discovered there's a lot of areas that need to be addressed, which speaks to the exploratory nature of it um, and the interdisciplinarity of it. So, the work as it stands now, and it has been for the last year, what we are also proposing, and very excitingly, Jenny Fuster just let us know that, am I allowed to say this yet? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that the contract for the next four years of, of work have, has just been executed. So we're very, very happy today. <laughs> so really, there, there's a series of different use cases and case studies that we're working on across what is now a foundation stream and then four interlinking substreams of work activities. So the foundation stream, of course, is probably you'd be understanding over the conversations we've been having today and certainly in our, uh, our discussions we had yesterday with all of the partner groups, is that Indigenous data governance and Indigenous data sovereignty is really key to get right within this work. Working out a way that it can be operationalised be functional for all different groups and peoples and communities across Australia is key to everything that we do in this project. So really that is the core piece of work that we are working on that cross cuts into the other activities or the other substreams. Um, the other four major packages, which each of them have between sort of three and eight activities in each. Um, the first one being the Indigenous data catalogue resources and extensions, which we'll show some examples of as we go along today. Um, this has been a significant piece of work that has had a lot of input from people across different universities, different groups over a longer period of time really than what we have been operating in this project. Um, the second substream is um, a series of activities looking at indigenous, indigenous spatio-temporal frameworks and infrastructure of which we'll also show you some examples of. Um, substream three is the data capability building for digital futures in Indigenous Australia. 
That's really about looking across both all of the communities of Indigenous data custodians, as well as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves, looking at different ways that infrastructure can be supportive in building capability. But it's also about thinking through pipelines of people with expertise, knowledge, interest to be working in this space in the future. There's not, although this is a big group of people coming together, there's still not very many people working on what is a huge endeavour that we all need to start looking at. So we do have a big series, well, a series of work packages looking at training, anything from the community controlled sector groups that we're working on case studies with, to pipelining students, to Indigenous internships, which Liam Jensen over here is currently on a 12 month internship with the ARDC situated within the Indigenous Data Network, which is brilliant. We love you. <laughs> um, so then the fourth substream is another large piece of work and it really has two um, assets it really probably needs to be split out into another sub, you know, separate substreams. But that is looking at Indigenous data repositories and data rematriation. You yeah. wanted to jump in and say? <clears throat> no, I, I just think I'd want to um, do, do a point of return back to a comment that was uh, raised before, um, before the lunch break. And it's talking about the magnitude or the scale or the size of things. Um, it is so monstrously big, this project. <laughs> um, it genuinely keeps us awake at night um, and has done for the last three years. Um, we'll do for the, <laughs> we'll do for the future as well. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it, and you can start to really see that when you start to understand how it is that it was structured in the first instance and then once more how it is reiterated within the second phase of that work. Okay, so really I've just, we've tried to summarise some of the achievements in the project in the last few years, which has been, look, it, it's, I'm surprised how much we've managed to get done across all of the different partner organisations and people working on this tirelessly. It's been a huge group effort, but really this is just an overview of some of the achievements. We're going to go through some of the highlights, certainly not, it, we're not really even scratching the surface, but... Really, we, uh, we've sort of looked at it four main areas where we've um, made progression across these few years that we've been working on it. So firstly, we've established, established foundational Indigenous data capabilities, tools and infrastructure. Again, we'll show you a couple of examples of that. Um, we've implemented training programs and workshops, enhancing capabilities of Indigenous ta data technicians and researchers. And I'll add to that also students and volunteers and a range of other different people. Levi's been very instrumental in a lot of the summer school that has summer schools that the ARDC has, has been running that's been highly successful. Um, we've also, with um, one of our colleagues in the Indigenous Studies Unit, have managed to get up a, a master's course in the Master of Public Health looking at um, data governance in Indigenous health issues which we're about to run for the first time this semester, which is very exciting. So there's a variety of different ways that we're trying to do that work. Um, we've also had extensive collaboration with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data custodians. And when I say that, I mean data custodians from all of those five different groups that Levi outlined before. Um, too many to name. And we continue to work with them and will continue to work with these groups and more. Um, something that we haven't probably discussed yet, but we'll raise a little bit of this. We've also started fostering really strong international partnerships with a range of different groups in different countries for a variety of reasons. Um, for example, we've, we've started collaborating with Hokkaido University, um, particularly with the Ainu and in International Studies Centre. Um, primarily, we're wanting to get up some capability building activities with Hokkaido University. We've also established ties with Universitas Hassanuddin in Makassar, um, looking at some of the ways that data can be shared across international borders. Those of you who are unaware of the history between the Makassans and particularly the northern jurisdictions of Australia, there's been extensive trade in fishing and the Trepang fishing trade 
since the 1600s, mm. is it? Yeah. And look, still not particularly legally continues today. <laughs> um, we actually visited one of the Trepanga Islands, I think it was at the start of last year, and had discussions with some of the fishermen who really are still coming and doing some of this trade. We have worked with some of the Yongu elders who have passed down stories across time immemorial <laughs> about the trade that it was undertaken with Macassans. We've started working with different groups, particularly in Arnhem Land, uncovering particular sites, but looking at sharing some of that knowledge and data across borders. Can I just jump in and say, <clears throat> one of the things about that work is so significant is when we talk about the concept of Indigenous data governments or sovereignty, um, and you know, particularly within the climate, um, Within Australia, when we talk about um, treaty and progressing treaties, most states and territories within Australia are, in, uh, are progressing that work, as you'll know. But one of the things that's significant, I guess, within the context and establishing those relationships, um, specifically within the north parts of Australia, um, and looking at the, the work between um, Macassar and the north, is that a lot of people aren't aware that there are pre-existing uh, treaty negotiations and water and land sea agreements that have been there since the 90s and, you know, um, they need to be uh, critically investigated as well if we're having a, co a conversation around Indigenous data governance because part of that work is ultimately um, e examining what is the cur uh, current legislative uh, landscape as well. So it's one of the reasons and, you know, um, provides a bit more context as to why we've uh, fostered that strong relationship up there as well. Yeah. And we actually have a workshop upcoming in late August where we have a number of people coming over from Akasa. We're holding a workshop in Yakala with a series of young elders and other academics working in the area. Um, so that's exciting things to look forward to. Um, as mentioned before, we've also done an awful lot of work um, working with, with specialists um, to get input from technical providers and research institutions across Australia. Um, a really key element that we've been focusing on has also been integrating Indigenous knowledge systems with research data science, which really underscores that importance yet again of working with different communities across Australia to ensure we're not just doing the same old thing over and over again. We're breaking down some of the silos and respecting knowledge, all knowledge. <laughs> um, We've also worked on establishing novel data governance frameworks that are culturally appropriate and align with community needs. This work too is ongoing. And we've laid groundwork for sustainable Indigenous data governance into the future. This work is not going to stop at the end of this period. As mentioned, we've got another four years and I suspect it will take a lot longer than that, but we're up for the challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I felt a bit guilty just pushing you off the microphone all the time. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the examples that we've done within that body of work and across both phase one and phase two is looking at place-based consultations with multiple clan groups. And this is specifically looking at the digitisation work up in Yurikala and North East Arnhem Land. Um, one of the things that we've done and what's really significant about that work, it might not sound um, like, a, like a great achievement, but is that we've progressed digitisation of 50 years with a nationally significant material. Um, that process has been so complex and we've been met with challenges um, at every corner and every turn, um, not just from those uh, legislative and not from the, I, I guess, some of the... Um, philosophical um, elements that sit above that as well, but... Can explain the photo? <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can see me ducking around a the corner there. Um, <laughs> but the, it's the... Top right corner. Yeah. So the top right corner is... Um, we mentioned before, earlier today, that the archive is critically under threat by black mould as, as far as the climate, um, as far as humidity. Um, a few years ago, North East Arnhem Land was the wettest place on the earth. Um, they had a torrential season of rain, and as a result, uh, water ended up breaching the LPC, or the Literature Production Centre, uh, which is at the Yurikata School. And as a result, the humidity up there... Yeah, in the archive. In the archive. And so what happened is a lot of that material 
um, ended up uh, becoming infested with black mould. I'm sure for any of you who are aware um, of the challenges of black mould within collections, um, it is catastrophic. Um, one of the things that we've done is um, pivoting and looking at um, new and innovative ways. So there's um, significant research under there on how it is that we can do that containment as well. Um, and looking at long-term preservation of community-based archival material. Um, it looks pretty weird that we're out there sunning objects, but um, <laughs> it's one of the new methods that, um, scientific methods that was developed around um, how it is that you can contain that. So that's a really distinct piece of work and we're the first people doing that, so. And it really is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do we call it? The suction machine? <laughs> <laughs> the sucker. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's actually um, really kind of, it's being innovative in that sense, um, standing up not just indigenous data governance, but also uh, methods and models um, for long-term care and preservation within community uh, for the minimum viable, uh, minimum viable um, product doing that. Yeah, so that was really you. We got the materials when, once we're doing as we're doing the digitisation. Um, not all of them because there are multiple copies of some, but making sure that we get rid of the black mould, basically putting it through a food vacuum suction <laughs> element, um, then putting it out in the sun, making sure it gets to 30 degrees temperature. It actually kills the black mould. Mm -hmm. Then when we put it back in the archive, even though there is still black mould there, if it stays suctioned, the black mould is gone. So anyway, so we're constantly trying to work through different pragmatic and um, ways to work within remote regions in the process of this work. Uh, also, there, there has been a lot of training of, uh, I don't know how many interns, students and volunteers we've had up there, but we've been 16. up there 16, 16 so far. Um, and there's bound to be more. We have a few repeat offenders who love it so much standing there and scanning all day long. <laughs> you loved it, didn't you, Liam? <laughs> um, so as I mentioned before, um, some of the other technical things that we've developed throughout the project and throughout the, the phases of the project um, is some technical uh, tooling and capabilities. So one of them, um, which is probably the, the, the most uh, prolific is the catalogue or a federated data model um, and integrating metadata <laughs> across different custodians. As I said, we're working and looking at engaging five different data custodian types. So uh, this work is kind of our crowning jewel in the sense that it's in our mind, um, the one thing that's able to um, bring about a federated uh, model and really kind of look at the idea of um, you know, creating openness of Indigenous data and knowledges and assets within the landscape of Australia. Uh, there's a QR code there, so you, you can go and interact with that tooling as well. And we put that one in there because Liam told me off in the last speech that we didn't have QR codes there. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the other things that we've developed as well that goes in uh, complement with that is the spatial data catalogue as well. Um, QR code is also on there. This one as well. Um, as well as uh, that, we've also got a metadata entry form. So in the um, realms of curating metadata as well, um, one of the things that we've developed is a uh, metadata entry tool to help start doing some of that curation uh, curation data assets as they uh, become available and uh, as people start to discover and contribute. And can I just jump in, and we do have a reason why we're putting these QR codes up here. We really want, it, this work is iterative, you know, we will continue to improve it and we need as much feedback as possible. Don't expect all of this to be pretty yet, we're not focusing on that. <laughs> It really has been the technical infrastructure of it. So we really encourage people to have a look. We really are open to feedback and suggestions. The more the merrier. Um, so please do jump online and have a look and let us know what you think. And if you have any ideas of how to improve any areas, we'd be really open and thankful for it. Um, and also a set of vocabularies, um, just to kind of reiterate and dovetail on what Kristen was saying as far as that process being iterative. Um, one of the things that we're very conscious of is that 
we, we were aware that this needs to be um, a, a moving piece of work and that it can't be something that just gets stood up and set and forget. Um, one of the things that we've long had a challenge with in the context of Australia is information being locked into systems, um, new stuff and old stuff being deaccessioned. So one of the things that we're really mindful of and what we do need that critical feedback, you know, especially from public engagement, is you know um, giving us some of that critical foresight as well and really challenging us as well. Um, we can't just arrive at the idea that this is going to be the, <laughs> the grand uh, solution for everything. So, um, yeah, we, we, we are critically seeking that uh, backwards as well because, after all, this is also a research project. And I, I see that Kylie's put something in the... Kylie Brass has put something in the questions um, asking us we should have actually mentioned this. Um, a part of the work of the metadata entry tool that's been created is a somewhat, we found out, controversial um, scoring <laughs> that we've developed in the context of the project. So essentially, as you go in there, you can use this metadata tool. Everyone should be able to use this metadata tool. As you enter the metadata requested, you'll end up, you can see the circles on the right-hand side there, you'll end up with both a FAIR and a CARE score. Highly controversial, I know. Um, there are multiple reasons for this, which we don't really have time to get into today. Um, we know it's not perfect. It too will change over time. But the main thing we're hoping it will do is to encourage data, indi Indigenous data custodians to actually think through these things as they're putting together catalogues. Um, again, go in and have a play. See for yourself. Let us know what you think. Getting your <laughs> oh yes, we'd like to invite our colleagues up, so some of our partners who have also been working on a fabulous um, case study project within the IARC project. I'll pass over to Sandra, Penny and Caleb. And Caleb. Sorry, Caleb. I'm moving quickly because I know we don't have much time. I'm speaking in staccato. Sandra Phillips, Walker Walker and Gureng Gureng, University of Melbourne Faculty of Arts, Professor of Publishing and Communications, um, lead CI of a partnership activity 2022 to 2023 under the auspice of the lead project led by distinguished Professor Marcia Langton. Um, almost entirely curiosity led almost entirely curiosity-led. I have no subject matter expertise. I have exceptional communication skills, um, and I managed to eke out of the University of Queensland $80,000 to match the ARDCs through NCRIS $80,000 for 2022 to 2023, on the basis of curiosity, passion, um, and commitment, and as I said, my exceptional communication skills. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, a second year was also initiated off the back of that, which I wasn't centrally a part of. Now, just some threads. Uh, Kristen just asked us, in fact, if we would get up and share some from the signature piece of work through that partnership activity, which I coined Sand Pit in the Sandstone, right? So we see these durable, immutable, objects um, and the idea of stamp it was to play inside of it to play differently um, to change the power dynamics and the paradigm of working so the first thing in the design of sand pit in the sandstone that i and then we did was to ensure that we got people like dr katrina mills who's now part of the creative arts project um, in the zoom and in the room um, michael ed Anthropology Museum, so Katrina from Oslet, Michael Ed from Anthropology Museum, Jane Wilcox, Wilcox, also from the Anthropology Museum. I do recall, Jane, you were a little bit reluctant. <laughs> Two years later, she's the strongest advocate of this work. Maggie's in there now through Oslet as well. Um, essentially custodians of collections at the University of Queensland. We literally got together in Zooms and around um, tables and people were going, why don't we do this more often? Why don't we actually talk with each other? Why don't we share what our 
you know, challenges and barriers and aspirations are? And why don't we learn to, how to engage better with Indigenous peoples, communities, cultures and knowledges? Um, so that was kind of the animating uh, energy of Sandpit in the Sandstone. I will hand over now, I know, <laughs> to Penny to get some specifics, share some specifics about the way in which Penny worked, Dr Penny Holiday worked with the Mythica Aboriginal Corporation through this process. And Caleb is our shining Masters of Museum Studies um, exhibit <laughs> um, for that work as well. Oh, thanks, Sandra, and hi, everyone. And Caleb has just completed um, an in, a master's thesis on Indigenous style of governance as a result of coming to uh, Windora with its last year to work with the Mythica Aboriginal Corporation. So, and I hear a lot of people are talking about it, so we're interested to see what he's popped in it about collection houses and Indigenous data governance. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Mandana Mapa at um, the Anthropology Museum at UQ for introducing us and, 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 and you know, facilitating um, the relationship first up. And Jane was very instrumental in this as well with the Mythica Aboriginal Corporation. I guess um, the information is on our WordPress, which I know somebody's working on it today, so <laughs> if it, it, it might be a bit if it crashes, then that's it. But what I wanted to, <laughs> this being updated as we speak, but what I wanted to touch on was a lot, of, a lot has been said about relational aspects and um, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And one of the things that has come across really strongly and um, with the Mythic Aboriginal Corporation is that um, that relational aspect is so beginning in the beginning. So uh, from the ground up, we never went in over the top. It was always about what can we do for you, what's the benefit sharing here and I must say Jane is very much sitting on my shoulder a lot because she has a lot more experience in this space working in the Kieran Derry um, exhibition with the Mythic Aboriginal Corporation. So things like um, co-creation, co-collaborative, benefit sharing, they're not just terms, we really do um, put them into action with our project. Uh, we actually paid the rangers who work with us this year for their time and they said to us, you don't know how much time is taken out of our daily work through research activities. Um, so we pay them a consultation fee um, because, as I said to them, if I went to a mechanic and said, hey, can I um, get you to work on my car? I'll watch and I'll go away and you know, tell people how good you are. Um, he'd laugh at me. And, it, and really, when you think about it, so much work is done in this space. So that's something to think about. Um, so we were partners always. Every step of the way, we're partners with our project, um, with, the, with the mob out there. Also, um, they joined our governance committee. So the Gorringe family in particular, Shawnee and Tracy Hall and Joshua Gorringe were present in all conversations in this project and also across the board with Sam Pitt. So, um, you know, they would give us insight, input. The other thing was um, we talked about storage and indigenous data governance. I won't talk about that, but one thing recently, there's been a data breach. Mythica Aboriginal Corporation have shut down all research activities until it's been addressed. Anybody going into communities doing research work, you may have ARC partners. You might be okay with your Indigenous data governance, but you need to check and make sure that your partners are across this as well. Because it's on you, the onus is on you. If you've been working in a community for five or 10 years, what's going on in the other space as well? So, and also follow to the letter, the corporation's research framework. So since then, we went out and thanks to Rose, um, the Gorringe family, some of the girls attended Rose. We had Rose come in to UQ and talk about ISA protocols. Now, we could have filled that space three times over online and in the room. Um, and that was a revelation. And since then, the framework for research with the Mythica Aboriginal Corporation has been updated. Let's wrap it up. Yeah. Okay, that's it then. That's me. <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> I don't even get an introduction. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was roped into talking 15 minutes ago, so this is going to be a bit rough. But they asked me to talk about my pipelining, as Kristen said, as a student into becoming part of this community of experts and what was the word for people who are passionate about indigenous data, sovereignty, and its governance. 
So for me, studying museum studies, I went on this trip after my first semester when I didn't know anything and I was just a wee baby. And that was my first introduction to this space, which is the, a space where the stuff that we learn in our postgraduate, all this theory of ethics and aura and the idea of objects and what they mean to people, it's very abstract. They made us read Lacan. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> this is the actualization of this theory of where it comes into practice. And it was that that brought me into making my dissertation on the complex stewardish, stewardship, ownership, custodianship, and IP uh, interactions between UQ and its anthropology museum in my dissertation because I like to bite the hand that feeds me. <laughs> and that's what's brought me here today. So thank you to all of you for bringing this community together and for getting this movement started because to me as a student this is practicalities and how we actually do the things that we are taught in universities. Excellent. Thank you. And um, in wrapping up, the, this iteration, this version of Sandpit in the Sandstone is finished as of 30 June. And um, this can be a quasi little celebration and farewell. And we've run out of time. Thank you so much for the 15 minute notice pulling you guys up here. And thank you all. Um, we're really excited about the next four years and hope that more of you can join us in the work we're doing. Did I? <laughs>deadly you are about how your fan, fan, what is it, uh, communication skills, you just have to come up and say deadly in the daytime and deadly in the night time, that's it, 24-7. And Kristen, I will chip you, where's Kristen? When you're referring to my bro Liam, you know he's got a new nickname now, he's yeah. L-I-M, that's his rap, I can't wait to introduce you tomorrow, L-I-M, with Will I am. Um, now, uh, apologies, Nicola, we don't have time for questions if there's any, because um, I want to introduce these three handsome gentlemen who are just ready to make their way. The handsome debonair, you were trying to work out which one I'm going to go to, <laughs> Michael Hoare, and my old bro Simon Musgrave, and of course Robert. The floor is yours. Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, wonderful to be here again. Um, I'll just... Uh, yeah, this one here, okay. Okay, so Language Data Commons of Australia, why are we doing this? Um, so this is something I say every time I stand up, uh, reminding people that Australia is not just an English-speaking country, it's a massively multilingual country, there's more than 400 languages spoken here, um, it's home to the oldest, uh, one of the oldest continuous cultures and languages in the world, a quarter of the world's languages are spoken in Australia and its regions. It's a really diverse place, so it's, it's a really exciting place to be. Um, there's been amazing work over the past uh, few decades in acknowledging Nick T. Berger with Paradisic, among other things, um, where large collections of language data have been amassed, but there's also lots of stuff out there which is in severe danger. It sits on people's hard drives that are nearly about to die and all sorts of things there. Um, so it, it's really a, a time imperative project. There's also at the same time, um, you've been hearing, hearing a lot of think about AI and LLMs and all of that, and text is at the centre of that too. And unfortunately, you know, AI is really good, but it, it can't speak languages for you, it can't revitalise languages. Um, if the AI, AI could do it, it wouldn't really mean anything anyway, right? Um, it's all about people that's at the centre of it. When we think about languages, we're thinking about written, spoken, signed, multimodal, all the forms of it around. Oops. Um, in, in our team, um, for our collaborators, there's a, a growing group of collaborators and then partnerships that we're building here. Um, I can't go through all, all of the, the 
really uh, cool names here on the list, but there's a couple of people in the room. Nick's here in the room, Rose is in the room, um, and others uh, were here yesterday as well. And I, and also acknowledging people online as well. Um, also wanted to acknowledge the LDACA team as well, and I can't go through all of them, but there's some really amazing people, including uh, Robert, our program manager, uh, Simon, our training and engagement lead. Here's Peter Sefton. I'm kind of glad he's not here today. If you know Peter, he's really tall. Uh, he has a beard as well, and he makes me look like a hobbit, so I'm really <laughs> glad. <laughs> He's not here standing next to me like he normally is. He's just come back from overseas. Um, and so we're going to try and channel PT to you from the tech side. Uh, there is Moises in the room somewhere who will actually answer any questions um, about that. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge and celebrate the expertise of all of our CIs, uh, all of our partners, and all of the people working on LTACA. Um, it's really exciting to work with all of these amazing people. It's also really humbling. Um, and I think uh, one of the things I've learned along the way, the longer you spend working in this LDACA, Hassan Indigenous RDC space, the more you realize how much you don't know. Um, and it's really exciting to, to just every day have your mind cognitively reorganizing as, as you come across different ways of thinking and being in Australia. It's really quite a, a humbling and, and really wonderful thing to do, even though we're working in research infrastructure that sounds really boring, but it's, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and I think just to the funders out there, um, the thing with what we're doing here is it's it's an opportunity to show international leadership. I think Australia always thinks, oh, we've got to fly, follow Claren in Europe or we've got to follow that mob in the US and, and so on, right? But I think the group we have here is, is a group that can show international leadership about how you combine, and I'm borrowing from Brother Grant here, ancient ways of knowing with modern ways of doing. There's not really anywhere that can do that. So, you know, funders. Uh, um, just who's involved? This has been a real learning journey th for us, I think. Um, we started off uh, thinking more about the users who wants to, to get at language data. Um, so we kind of started with data users, persons or groups who want to find and use uh, data materials. But we quickly realized that data stewards and custodians are a really important group in LDACA as well. So those are people or persons groups responsible in some ways for data materials. Uh, and then, of course, we're talking with, about communities as well. Um, and that's been a real learning journey because you've got communities, indigenous communities, you have researcher communities, you have other language communities. And then you have all the kind of disciplinary communities, computer scientists and linguists and archivists and, and gosh, anyway, there's, there's a lot of ways of talking about things and you learn a lot from the ways in which people talk and, and think about things and do things as well. Um, just overall, um, when we we're talking about the outcomes that we're aiming for, that we've been aiming for for the past three years and going on into the next four years, um, what we go for is simple, stable, flexible and inclusive infrastructure, right? Um, and our aim in doing that is we really want to maximise autonomy for all of those user groups because we're quite well aware that we couldn't possibly know what everyone wants. And even groups themselves, they're trying to figure it out because we're figuring out what the technological affordances are. We're also dealing with a really changing landscape and, and, and coming to terms with histories uh, and, and events of the past that need to be dealt with. So we, we can't figure it all out for people. But what we can do is to provide an environment which allows those choices uh, to be made. Um, so it's in that spirit. Um, I'll hand over to Robert, who will give a lot more detail. Maybe just a little bit more, not much more. So language data is amassed. It's dispersed all over the place, much like um, our mobs now, much like the language data commons team dispersed all over the continent. Um, some of the challenges that we do face is the fact that it is dispersed everywhere. Um, it's also underutilised or it's at risk of being lost forever. There's a lack of tools and skills to truly derive research value from the data. 
Um, a lot of these tools are done in an ad hoc way. Um, that's inclusive of analysis tools, annotation methods um, that are used, and all in all, that's hampering the reproducibility of it. Some of the other challenges are around um, that language data is rarely organised or described in reusable ways, and that is if it's described at all. We touched briefly before on the condition of data and the challenges in terms of um, trying to work with that and derive value for those various community groups. Uh, it's also too very difficult to know what language data exists and where to find it. Uh, there aren't, uh, in terms of processes for granting permissions and uh, getting access to data, well, they're either absent um, or they aren't easy to understand or apply. Um, also too, in terms of guides and training for collections uh, and handling and using uh, data, those too are scattered and difficult to find. So this sort of lists a few of the data challenges as we have seen them, and this is, is not something we've been able to develop overnight. We've had to do this quite collaboratively, and it's taken quite a while to articulate it in this way. So I hope it helps. We're not purporting that this, that these are all of the challenges and perhaps um, there are more that you think we haven't covered and we really, in that iterative fashion, really welcome that feedback. Um, but I hope that sort of helps describe it to you in a, in a somewhat concise uh, way. Um, to summarise that though, these are really um, I guess we're looking at around collecting, organising, pre uh, preservation challenges, findability, access. Those are the kind of things that we are concerned with moving forward. And I hope LIM, you will um, approve. We have a few QR codes in here and I just hope that they take you to the right places. <laughs> um, I do want to share with you briefly our focus um, in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, we are spread out across five different activity streams. The first one focusing uh, on developing social and technical foundations for a national uh, distributed archival repository, and that includes a few key areas, um, which I'll run through, just uh, shared collaborative data governance and a standards framework. The other one is shared data access, authentication and authorization policies, procedures and processes. Um, that's also shared technical infrastructure for curation and storage of language data. And the other part of that activity stream one is around shared technical infrastructure for collecting and annotation of language data. The second activity stream is around, um, well, we continue to uh, securing vulnerable and nationally significant collections of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, languages. Uh, indigenous languages in the Australia's Pacific region and the different varieties of that. Uh, also to Australian English and migrant languages, as well as sign languages of uh, Australia and its region. The third activity stream is around developing a national data portal for accessing and repurposing language data of significance to researchers and communities, as Michael's described it. Um, and both that's, that's held in GLAM institutions, inclusive of libraries, archives, museums, as well as uh, any sort of language collections that are held uh, uh, in the distributed archival repositories, but also to notwithstanding the challenges around orphan data also and the data that we find in all different places. The fourth activity stream is around um, establishing an integrated analytics environment for researchers to create fully described reproducible research on written, spoken, multimodal and signed text in accordance with open science principles and aligned with the community expectations for research of practical benefit. And I know we're going quickly, but we're on, on a time limit here. And the, the fifth one, of course, is around providing training and developing resources for researchers and communities to support best practice in accessing, analysing and archiving language data in line with fair and care principles and the other um, bits of work that we do reformatively in that space. How do we do this? Um, we have been on, as, as Michael said, we've been on a, a great learning journey and we are forever reforming the way that we're doing this. How are we doing it at the moment? Well, we're looking at these uh, five priority areas um, to tackle this work, notably 
um, efforts in project management, data collection, research technology, uh, training analytics and user design, and the final one being industry engagement, policy and communication. So they're quite broad areas um, and we have to sort of balance that adequately from a res uh, resourcing perspective also, but that's how we're tackling this work this year at least. Um, the next one, now I want to tell, I'm just going to remind everyone, Moises, wave your hand. Have a yarn to Moises if you have questions around this, but I do want to just, this, this quote came from, uh, is, is to do with the Archisto platform in terms of the long-term uh, preservability of well-described data is always the first uh, consideration. So with that in mind, we consider uh, what are the means for achieving this goal? So if you look at the how section where we're sort of doing some work in terms of packaging of data and metadata together. Um, the other part of that is around acknowledging that licenses are a crucial part of the metadata and um, also to um, RO crates and using that as a, as a standard and the fact that that's becoming increasingly accepted more broadly. And in terms of the types of tools that we have in t uh, for supporting this, um, using Crato uh, to, to sort of prepare it in, in that regard, the editor tool, and also to the ONI portal um, structure for, for the data portals. Um, and there is a more detailed um, this is more detailed in the PILARS protocols, which I, I think that QR code will take you there, I hope. So click on that and have a look. <laughs> I will talk a little bit more about that, um, um, that PILARS implementation. Oh, in terms, sorry, in terms of making things interoperable and scalable, there's a few examples here and lines going everywhere, but the one example I'll give you is the paradisic one, if you can see that line running through. So the paradisic, and we've got um, Nick here, um, that collection is, is really quite large. Um, and so the point I want to make is the connection with paradisic is you can see it's demonstrating that in this, in this instance, that tech stack is really quite, quite scalable in terms of how we work with a lot of data and different types of data, language data, that is. Um, and finally on this one, I just want to, so, so this is where we're talking about the pillars, the protocols. Now, if you're unfamiliar with that, that, that should be the same QR code. Um, it will take you there. Please do have a read through. Um, it's important that we support fair principles and ensuring that data is well described, the metadata is identified with persistent identifiers, and that shared services with good governance are in place to store interoperable data, to make it findable and provide appropriate access controls. Um, these protocols could form the basis for design, evaluation, procurement of um, archival repository services. And so that's what the PILARS protocols are all oriented around supporting you to do. Fundamentally, there are three main protocols um, if you click on that uh, QR code, you'll be able to go and see them in detail, but I'll let you know what they are, and that is that they're further detailed beyond the three, but uh, the first one is that data is portable, that assets are not locked into a particular mode of storage, interface, or service. The second one is that data is annotated, and that contents, structure, provenance, and access and reuse permissions are comprehensively described with metadata and licenses. And the third one is around governance. Um, that governance is in place for each archival repository. And as I said, that's further detailed in the protocols. I'm going to, uh, our, we have our Indigenous uh, Languages data portal and a lot of user design work continues, um, reaching those various community groups in terms of what people, uh, what researchers are looking for in terms of finding, accessing that material through the portal. So, trying to be as iterative and responsive to the needs of those community groups, um, particularly with the search engine design and the way in which we use perhaps Auslan language codes and incorporate various different tags and ways of finding that data. So further to that, uh, so work continues on that. I guess I have a quick, uh, I want to give you a, a, just a quick case study because this one was quite interesting. Um, we worked with the Carolyn Tennant Kelly papers. Now, I mentioned orphan data. Um, this is an example of that. So we, we partnered with the UQ Library to 
do some uh, to see that that collection was reflected on the portal. Now this material came from a back shed um, and um, that QR code will actually take you to a detailed um, little sort of, I um, uh, forget what we called it, a learning discussion paper or something about the process that we did. So read that for the further, um, more detailed version, but I'll give you the rundown. So it was found by the university, it was brought in, um, Significant work, um, actually I won't tell you that first, I'll, I'll build the story. So we did a bit of work with it, the UQ library, we ingested it into our data portal and I asked them, so how many languages are reflected, indigenous languages are reflected in the collection? And at that time the UQ library were able to tell us that 22 languages were in this collection and I said, no there aren't, there's actually 121 languages. So how did we know that? Um, fortunately for us, in 2011, 2010, 2011, um, uh, a few academics at UQ, um, one of them, well, Uncle Michael, who's in the room with us today, was part of this, as well as David Trigger, Kim D. Reich and Tony Jeffries, um, did an indexing exercise and went through this, uh, with, through this work and did, did the important work of effectively enriching this metadata. And so that revealed... Um, quite a few things. So, for example, where the index referenced 121 languages, the library catalogue only recognised 22. So this is a significant findability impediment um, for the remaining 99 languages that aren't reflected in that collection, um, which is problematic for our mob wanting to find that. And it only caught my eye because from that index I knew uh, Goreng Goreng was in there, there was significant material in there, and it wasn't reflected. In the, um, in the library collection. So those are some challenges that we need to be really aware of moving forward is that's almost by chance because those two things didn't marry up. So now we've been able to use that work and embed that in this moving forward. Um, that work identified, um, yeah, 121 entries, keywords 15, place name, you've, you've got them there. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Simon. Okay, um, I'm gonna f I know I have to move fairly quickly, so some of these slides I'm not going to say a lot about. This is just one to show you the kind of resources we're disseminating via our website. This is material that's primarily targeted for data custodians, people who might be interested in uh, checking that they are following good practices or that they might be looking towards collaborating with us on the data that they hold. And I'll come back to that briefly later. We've already seen a picture of what an ONI portal looks like with the indigenous portal. This is the picture of what's on the main portal at this stage. Why is it interesting? Because, as Rob already mentioned, this is a relatively lightweight service which runs on top of the carefully packaged data and metadata. This was inspired by Paradisec's approach, and here's some an image of some stuff out of Paradisec. Paradisec pioneered this approach of keeping data at rest separate from the services you provide over it. We've been inspired by it, we've followed it, the PLARS protocols follow it, and the kind of result we've got from this is that earlier this year, with the assistance of Paradisec's developer, we aligned the APIs for the two projects, took all the metadata, catalogue data from Paradisec, and could run an ONI interface on it pretty much straight away, right? So this is the kind of interoperability, kind of building a wide ecosystem that we're working on. And an example of where we're heading with this is here. This is the um, opening the Multilingual Archive of Australia project based at the University of Sydney, which works with materials in languages other than English and other than Indigenous languages in Australia, mainly historical materials. And we're now collaborating with this project, in, again, working with stuff that Nick Teberg has been involved in, a tool called Nyingan, which is developed originally for annotating and uh, digitising handwritten and manuscript materials for indigenous languages. We're now working with Omar to see if we can use that kind of technology with the materials they work with, which are historical materials in 
um, migrant languages in Australia. And again, we're working with the common packaging standards for data and metadata, so everything should be accessible in the same ways in the long term. To give you an idea of the kind of material we have, working, have worked with so far, this shows you the kind of collections that we've been onboarding into the LDACA system. As you can see, it covers a range of different kinds of language material, through from just written text, through to, it's kind of back to front for our normal way of thinking. So at the right hand end, you've got just written text. At the left hand end, you've got full multi multimedia, multimodal resources, things like um, gesture and sign material. And beyond that, there's other material which, uh, although it's not yet being introduced into the full ecosystem, it's being, at least we're collaborating with people to make it potentially usable. Uh, in some cases, you'll see several of these are indigenous collections where it's not clear to us that we'll ever want to put them in the same kind of access environment as our main access environment, but we know at least that we will have the good quality data and metadata which people can then work with and do what they need to do with. And just another quick case study to give you an idea of how this all works. Uh, the work of Mitchell and Delbridge, who are two academics at the University of Sydney, 1950s and 1960s, is fundamental to our understanding of how Australian English sounds. They were the first people who did extensive recording of people speaking, Australian speaking, and then did some acoustic analysis on it. And a major part of what they did was a collection of data from schools across Australia. Uh, you can see 330 schools were involved in this. They, they just wrote to school principals. This was in the days before ethics committees existed, obviously. <laughs> And you know, school principals locked kids in rooms with tape recorders <laughs> and they collected 7,736 recordings of kids. Uh, and that was on reel-to-reel -reel tapes. At some point, the University of Sydney, who, because they were University of Sydney academics, they had the material. At some point, they realised reel-to-reel tapes were not necessarily that stable. And every time you, you run them, you degrade the material, right? So it was digitised back there in the uh, 1990s at the National Film and Sound Archive. And the University of Sydney continued to make that material available online through the library. Uh, and then the Australian National Corpus Project, which Michael headed and I was involved in as well, we made some of that material, a small portion of that material only available online later. So there was some material, it was more or less accessible, uh, but there were problems. For one thing, the University of Sydney kind of hid this. It kind of came up in the library catalogue, but it wasn't obvious where you went for it. It was on a kind of external website off to the side somewhere. Uh, and it also became clear to us when we started talking to them that the library were thinking in terms of their policy of what they would do with this. Obviously, they weren't going to jettison it, but there were some questions, I think, about how long they could continue to make it easily available. So we, uh, we collaborated with them and now we have the complete collection. It's been packaged according to RA Crate standards and it's all discoverable and all accessible through our portal at this stage, which we think is a fantastic result because it's incredibly important data. If you want to hear what people sounded like speaking, kids in Australia speaking 50, 60 years ago, this is where you need to go. It's interesting, they sound different. We mentioned, or Rob mentioned earlier, that part of what we're doing and is developing analytic tools for people who work with language data, particularly text data. We had a separately funded project early on called the Australian Text Analytics Platform, which is now part of the Language Data Commons of Australia project overall. And we've followed two broad streams of development in this area. One is based at the University of Queensland, a language technology and data analysis laboratory. This is an initiative which I think it's fair to say rests almost entirely on the shoulders of the fabulous Dr. Martin Schweinberger. Unless you want to claim some credit also, Michael. <laughs> um, yeah. 
this is a wonderful set of online resources, tutorials and notebooks giving you an introduction to all the basic methods people used in text analysis, plus some statistical methods as well. In addition to these general and fairly, well, they're introductory, but they'll take you a long way. Um, in addition to those tools, we've developed some more specialised ones as well. Most of these so far have been be created by our partners at Sydney Informatics Hub at the University of Sydney. Things like a tool which will run over text and identify quotations. Not just the ones that have got quote marks around them, but ones that are like indirect speech. It'll pick those up and tell you all of them in a text and attribute them to a speaker or a source. Uh, they also developed a semantic tagging tool where you can run text through it and it gets tagged according to semantic categories. What kinds of things are these or what kinds of activities? We've also developed a couple of very specialised tools in kind of case study research projects where we've worked directly with individual researchers to produce some interesting possibilities. Also very important in our activities has been training and outreach. We've delivered a lot of training in the last couple of years, I'm very proud to say, uh, across various areas and to various audiences. We've delivered training on just simple aspects of data management. This might seem like it's not directly our um, our concern, but we find that there's a need for it, that people are, partic are particularly at the level of HDR students and maybe early career researchers, they have questions. They're not necessarily given any training or any idea about what is good data management practice. So we've been working in that area. We have been working on delivering training about how you care for data, if it's your responsibility to look after it, uh, for people, data custodians, and then also on how you might prepare and package data according to our principles, which is also for data custodians, but more for ones who are more likely to be wanting to work with us directly. We also have been developing training about how you access data. The um, portal, as Rob said, we're still iteratively working on it. But I think at this stage it's becoming clear that there are some aspects of it which will always be a little forbidding, a little bit difficult for people to get their heads around the first time they come there. So it's important that we do develop this training that says, OK, we understand that this is not necessarily as easy to work with as Google. Let me give you some hints about how you can work effectively with this kind of interface. And then we provide training on analysing data for researchers. We've done this across various venues, um, but I think the thing that I particularly want to call out here, and Tom, going back to your metaphor from yesterday, here's a bit of, a bit of weft for you. We've had a really great experience working collaboratively with another group on providing training in this analysis area. So a big call out to, to Marissa Takahashi and her Australian Digital Observatory team at QUT. We've done, I think it's getting up towards five joint workshops now, and that's been a great cross-pollinating experience. Okay, I'll finish there. Questions that anyone would like to ask of these handsome gentlemen? Nicola? Nicola? May and June. May and June. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation, it was fantastic. Um, Simon, it just really made me wonder about our ethics of reuse of data and whether this work is um, expanding the um, horizons of new possibilities in that respect. I think there's two questions there which I'll try and answer separately. One, as Rob mentioned, a crucial part in the protocols document that we've prepared is around having a 
clear language statement of who can use this data and for what purposes. And we will not make any data available through our portal if we don't have that signed, sealed and delivered from the data custodian. So we have a clear commitment to making exactly specific for the user what they can do with data. Um, in terms of what I think is the second question, are we expanding possibilities? Yeah, of course we are, but I think we're taking a fairly cautious approach and making sure that we don't let anything run away from us, that we don't have you know, that kind of specific statement of what can be used and what can't be used. Uh, thanks, guys. Really great presentation. Um, I'm really fascinated by the broadness of the remit of what you're doing, and this is as a, a part of a team that's about to start now, so, so a few years behind you. When you look at, you know, so you're looking at students, researchers, HDR students, custodians, um, community members, what, who are you finding are the people that are most accessing um, L, your data in LDACA? Like, wh where, have, where do you feel like you've had the most kind of traction with people into the projects? We, I don't think we can claim a huge amount of traction in terms of researchers accessing data at this stage because we inevitably building a, a large collection of data is slow. Yep. Uh, I think we can claim quite a good level of traction amongst people who are data custodians. Uh, I think word is spreading I think, and people are approaching us in case saying we've got this data what might we do with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, communities, what do you think, Rob? Um, I, I think there's probably various... One of the things we say is LDACA is many things to many people. And there's probably... And that's probably the, one of the challenges is uh, there's so many different inputs into why an individual would engage with LDACA and why we've sort of described those user groups like that. Um, it's probably difficult on that instance to say which user group has has engaged most because we also then, um, not to use your weaving and weft metaphor, yes, we've got the um, those user groups engaging in that way, but they're also engaging for different reasons. So the other thing to keep in mind is we're focused on making data findable, uh, findable, accessible, and reusable. So um, to Sandra's point before about um, licensing and permission for reusability, um, there's also another part to be said around just simply making the metadata available um, in terms of, you know, um, MOB in the Indigenous language context, mm -hmm. even if you cannot access it, um, if it's not accessible first and foremost, at least you are somewhat head started in knowing where it exists because it's dispersed everywhere. Yeah. So if we have that knowledge, one of the priorities we uh, want to push forward with those custodians is trying to make what can be made available, making it available so we're not prohibiting any work that could be taking place right here, right now. Just out of curiosity, Simon, for, who are the custodians of that? Like the the children's recordings. Who are the are the ch the children the custodians of that? Just that that's just out of interest. Very good question. <laughs> um, we dealt with the University of Sydney of Library on the basis that they had whatever permissions were necessary because they'd made, been making the material available online for twenty years. Um, but yeah, there's there's a genuine question there, and I. I mean, if anybody wants to go and try and trace 7,000 children who made recordings 60 years ago, good luck. That could have been you, Simon, 60 years ago. I was in Australia 60 years ago. Now, uh, it's now smoke time.
Sorry, if you've got any other questions, I'm going to, if I, if I may. Uh, oh, yeah. Just very quickly, because QR codes seem to be a topic. Um, we're working on a one-page information sheet about our project. There are copies outside. The QR code at the bottom points to a feedback form, and we'd be very happy to get any input we can from you. So if you have a few moments, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, we're on to our next session. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk very quickly because we're going to have to catch up a little bit of time. Uh, our next session is on the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons integrations activity. So uh, uh, in Jenny's slide, because you all have it in your head, of course, there was a grid of six cells. We had one which was labelled the CDL. There's actually a cluster of activities uh, that we call integrations. I'm being joined by Owen O'Neill, uh, who's been our uh, project manager on the um, Community Data Lab. Uh, and, oh, and there's the same slide again. Uh, but I'd like to start, of course, uh, by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today. On the, uh, so definitely acknowledging the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I'd especially like to extend that uh, acknowledgement and celebration to any First Nations people joining us in the room today. The, uh, the integrations, uh, what we call focus area, uh, is actually a, uh, is somewhat different to what we have seen in the other um, projects that we've been presented to uh, today. Uh, in that it takes in a number of smaller activities uh, that cross-cut our concerns um, in the other areas. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of the activities that we've undertaken in this space. Uh, just today we're going to talk about two. Um, the first and, and biggest and most important of them is the, um, the ARDC Community Data Lab, which Owen is going to talk to us about in a minute. Uh, and then I'll be finishing us off by talking about our activities around securing data. Uh, and how they kind of relate to each other as well. So, cool. big one. Big one, okay. Great, thanks. Um, hi everyone, I'm Owen, um, and I'm the project manager of the Community Data Lab project. Um, and um, yeah, so today I just want to provide a bit of an overview of the project, um, talk about some of the key activities, um, and outputs and a little bit of the context of where it's come from as well. So um, as a bit of background, um, people may or may not know um, of this um, report that came out in 2022. Um, so it was a consultation report uh, and it included uh, an environmental scan and also a lot of suggested um, enhancements that were identified through uh, quite a, an extensive consultation process. Um, so the CDL, the idea of the CDL sort of emerged um, from that. Um, and um, yeah, and so it fits into the House and Indigenous Research Data Commons um, area of work at ARDC. Um, so just to give you a bit of context of where it fits in. Um, yeah, so a little bit about the project itself. Um, so what do we mean by community data lab? So um, community, we're talking about communities of researchers um, and particularly uh, researchers that are using GLAM resources. So that's our focus. Um, the data aspect is, um, is focusing on Hass and Indigenous communities using GLAM data. Uh, and I guess the, the trickiest bit is the lab component because it's not obviously a physical thing. Um, it's more a conceptual um, idea around processes and procedures um, for developing software that can be used by researchers. Um, and yeah, so it's not a particular, um, you know, location on the web that you necessarily go to. It's, it's um, a little bit more ephemeral. Um, 
So some of the aims of the Community Data Lab project, um, so it's, it's offering a framework for researchers and developers, um, and um, it's not just about developing tools, but really it's also about developing a framework for, um, for creating functionality and tools. So um, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about the architecture, um, the concepts around that in a minute. Um, and so the idea is that it's going to be more responsive way of developing functionality. Um, and also hopefully it's cumulative over time. So we build more and more tools and resources that are available to people um, to utilize and uh, reuse and um, facilitate um, interoperability and that sort of thing. So, um, we've been, one of the project members uh, is Peter Sefton, who many people may know, um, and he's been doing a lot of work around the architecture and reference model, um, which sort of underpins the uh, CDL project, the Community Data Lab project. Uh, and the idea is, so, um, there's, we're really focusing around the infrastructure that underpins research. So um, it is, uh, it, you know, often data comes from many different um, sources. Uh, it's smashed together. Um, it may be saved in many, many different places uh, and can use lots of different types of tools. Um, and what we've been thinking about then is uh, having a more cohesive approach to thinking about workspaces, collections and guidance that um, can underpin uh, the research um, process. So um, yeah, so that's a little bit of a background around the uh, architecture and reference model um, that we're working with um, in the project. Um, yeah, and it's, it's really focusing, as, as we say, on um, GLAM data, but hopefully it's a pattern that can be used in, in other spaces as well going forward. So, it's kind of, so the idea is really to move away from bespoke uh, solutions that can be difficult to maintain and look at um, better ways of developing tools and resources. So, uh, it's a relative, it started relatively recently, the project. Uh, so we kicked off um, in June 2023. Um, it's, uh, we finished the first round of tools and development in, at the end of last year. And uh, we did some further refinement, largely based on that experience um, around the architecture and reference model as well, coming up to um, just finishing off uh, at the moment. And so there's some further work that we're planning a phase two for the project, um, which I think Tom might talk about um, in a little bit. So, uh, and I should mention as well, we've had a really uh, engaged uh, researcher panel, which who have been really great in providing input um, for the project outputs and the direction as well. So, so we've looked at some of the tools and um, and. Uh, outputs that we've been developing. I'm only going to talk about a couple. Um, one is the architecture and deployment patterns that I've mentioned before. Um, and another that I'll focus in on is the Trove Data Guide. But just to let you know as well, there's a bunch of other um, outputs that we've been working on. 
Uh, and if you want any more information on those, I won't be covering them today as such, but um, come and talk to myself or Tom um, and we can give you a bit more info. Uh, so image annotation, which is using a um, specification called AAAF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, um, which is a way of working with images and image collections. Um, we've been doing some work around data transformation of trove data specifically. Um, some geospatial work uh, and um, also stylometrics, which is text analysis. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and you can either speak to us or check out the ARDC website because there's more information on those outputs there as well. So one of the key outputs to date has been the Trove Data Guide. And this is something that Tim Sherritt's been working on furiously <laughs> over, the, over the course of the project. Uh, and it's, he's developed a really comprehensive resource around using Trove. Um, if you remember, I mentioned the research and consultation report earlier. Uh, and that highlighted a lot of the um, complexities and challenges um, with using Trove. Uh, so this is, you know, aimed at guiding people through uh, that, navigating, um, you know, for how to access and manipulate Trove data, um, what is and isn't possible, um, and some of the gotchas because uh, it's not always obvious. Um, it's such a large and diverse collection. Um, so, yeah, so it provides um, a whole bunch of examples uh, and it's growing over time as well. Tim's continuing to work on it. Uh, so there's reusable notebooks, there's data sets, there's instructions for how to use those uh, resources. There's also, he's been working on researcher patterns as a way of providing guidance as well. Um, so, yeah, so it's a great resource that um, has already got a lot of interest and traction. So, um, and also I should mention the, uh, that we're running a workshop um, for the Trove Data Guide in Adelaide uh, it's a face-to-face -face workshop on the 1st of July, so if anyone's in Adelaide uh, and is interested, um, please uh, sign up and come along. Uh, it's, um, we've aligned it with the start of the uh, Australian Historical Association conference that's happening in Adelaide, uh, but the workshop on the Trove Data Guide is free to attend, so you don't need to be registered uh, to attend the, project, uh, the workshop. Uh, and just a little bit of context, because you may have heard of the GLAM workbench as well, which is also um, related to uh, the Community Data Lab and complements the Community, uh, uh, community Data lab, lab and the Trove Data Guide. So um, the Community Data Lab is around providing some of the underpinning architectures and um, principles, I guess, uh, that support the development of the Trove Data Guide and the GLAM Workbench as well now. And where to next is the next <laughs> thing to talk about. Thanks, Owen. Um, so I'll just zoom out and, and set the scene for where to next. Uh, again, going back, uh, this was really, it started its life thinking about uh, building a, a collaborative layer on top of the Trove API um, in service of creating a platform specifically for accessing uh, Trove. Some of the things that we've learned in this first phase is that Trove is not the only source of data that we could be leveraging. And so what we want to do going into the second phase is to open it up to other APIs. Um, but it is very much about 
taking what's available and seeing how we can uh, enable this layer of collaboration. So it's not technically just a, a, a technical layer, but rather that there is this collaborative activity that sits on top of um, an API um, or a set of APIs uh, that researchers could build upon. Uh, so what we want to do in taking it into the next phase is to learn from what we've done in our co-design sessions or the way in which we did our co-design sessions in the first half of this year and then apply that thinking and mature it and, 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 and iterate on that practice going into a second phase where we have a much greater degree of researcher involvement. We want to centre the experience of the lab on the lived experience of researchers and using that uh, methodology of co-design um, to essentially develop short, sharp development cycles um, to develop continuing resources that cumulatively build over time and allow us to um, meet smaller needs that researchers are expressing. Uh, by compressing that timeline, what we're hoping to demonstrate through this is uh, a very short distance between identifying a researcher need and addressing it through the development of, um, of lightweight uh, infrastructure according to the principles that we found in this first phase. The first phase is a pilot phase. The second phase will be a full phase. Um, so we'll be looking for collaborative partnerships to do that. And we're already in conversations around that. Um, I'm anticipating, I don't want to be held to dates on this, uh, but I'm anticipating that we should be announcing the schedule for the co-design workshops. Uh, I don't know in the coming weeks or months. Uh, <laughs> I'm just looking at Nicola going, it may well be. Uh, we, we have a meeting on Thursday to lay down that, um, that full schedule. Uh, so I'm sorry, we, don't, we haven't had that meeting Thursday last week. Uh, otherwise, I'd be saying that. Now, if, the, um, if this activity was about looking at what we've got now and what we could do in terms of encouraging uh, good practices going forward. oh. And I just see Ian here, and I have to mention as well that one of, particularly if you're here today and you're interested in image annotation or in stylometrics in particular, I want to acknowledge the good work of uh, Systemic Solutions. And uh, if you would like to talk with Ian about either of the solutions that are developed in that space, do put your hand up for the people in the room. Do go and chat with Ian as well. Um, I'm going to turn to something that also involved uh, systemic solutions in part of the work as well. Um, the other part of the, uh, or one other activity that we had under uh, integrations was uh, around saving at-risk data. I think the talk from Inga uh, here this morning really actually laid out the context for why we have this in our program. Uh, there was a extended period of systematically underfunding um, infrastructure in this space that has led to a landscape um, of bespoke solutions. Um, and we are now dealing with the legacy of that lack of investment in the space. Um, and what we wanted to understand in uh, the saving at-risk data was that, OK, we need to look back and think about, OK, all of the wonderful data assets that have been developed in the last 15 to 20 years, uh, which are now in a, at peril, essentially, because uh, what happened is that a significant amount of technical debt was accrued in association with those data assets, and it actually takes a huge amount of effort to fill the gap in terms of what should have been done as proper infrastructure investments, but instead was done with whatever we could at the time. Um, we picked, uh, so this is a frequent pattern that you see arising from research in, uh, in the HAS domain in terms of the kind of assets that get developed. Uh, and it really is the backwards looking complement to the community data lab, which is again encouraging good practices going forward. Uh, I think also in this space, uh, we learned a lot about uh, what I would generally call closing the gap between GLAM and research. Um, there is some distance between pulling things out of uh, the GLAM sector, and there's a question of how do, we, how do we get closer to it on the other side of that um, when we produce these artifacts arising from um, uh, GLAM holdings. Uh, to a certain degree, what I'm about to talking, talk to you about is more plumbing than polish. That often happens. I think Simon 
was it Simon that said, oh, I'm sorry, it's infrastructure, it's a bit boring. Uh, there is an element of, was it, no, maybe it was Michael. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Shh, Michael. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a more plumbing than polish story uh, in what we're doing, in that um, uh, we took, uh, so with the leadership of Nick Teberger here in the room, uh, we looked at holdings in the Online Heritage Resource Manager, which is a system that's been essentially uh, mothballed and looked at the effort that we would take to rescue uh, the holdings within that um, collection uh, and to see what that actually took to do and how far we could get. Uh, and we had a similar one with Hurist, and that, this is the work also involving Ian McCrabbe and Systemic Solutions, but also Mike Lynch uh, at the University of Sydney, uh, looking again at a system that was developed to hold what I would call complex uh, cultural uh, materials, um, essentially. Um, uh, displaying linkages between elements and so on, often in a bespoke way, but within a system itself. So we thought there would be an opportunity there to understand the effort required to essentially migrate the data out of this into what we were seeing as emerging best practice around RO Crate um, and other technologies. So we wanted to apply those modern practices and see how much effort it took and, uh, and essentially kind of bring them up to the state that we are seeing going forward with projects like the Language Data Commons uh, and others where the data is being held in a way that is kind of migration ready, if you like, um, in that we're um, seriously decoupling the presentation of the data from the underlying retention of that data. There's a really important learning that we've had in the last decade. Um, uh, and I think another thing that we learned um, in the process uh, is that uh, again speaks to uh, I, some of the phrases that Ingo used uh, this morning is the how can we develop processes to triage um, or identify and prioritize where to put that energy. Um, so uh, this is the more plumbing than polish thing. Uh, one of the major outcomes for this is that we actually now have a set of data sets um, that are in this RO crate. Um, they essentially broaden the pool and the complexity, uh, the demonstrated complexity of holdings in RO crates to understand and stress test the tooling that we have in that space. And just to see what it like, looks like to put this on Figshare or other repositories as well. Um, there is actually a wealth of associated tooling that was developed um, in, um, in association with uh, the RO crates being exported in both of the, these cases. Um, if you would like to have a look at the Describo tool set, um, just have a quick Google of that. Um, and uh, some of the other acronyms that have been thrown around uh, today around ONI and RO Crate um, tooling as well, and the yeah, Kisto platform, all of these had little bits associated with them, which is not necessarily of interest to everyone. Uh, but if you do want to chase up, um, uh, come and uh, chat with me about um, that tooling, if that's your specific interest. Um, uh, and yes, uh, uh, the other outcomes, a little bit abstract again, but we're really getting a good sense of just how much input of energy we need to put uh, into these things when we do have these legacy systems. Um, and we have to essentially take whatever's in there as a complex cultural object and transform it into a state that can be uh, lying at rest, waiting for people to pick it up and, and use the tooling that we have as well. Um, and I think going forward, the other thing that we've realised with the, this particular area is that we uh, want to refocus or really frame this in terms of our relationship with the glam sector. Um, what we saw in the the experiments that we did is that uh, this was mostly focused on stuff that was arising on the university side and overall what we want to see is a, a kind of closing of the distance between the ways um, that we can collaborate with the glam sector um, that have, are often very often the source of the data that we're dealing with in this space uh, and the products of researchers um, which often sit to the side. Um, and with that, uh, I'm on time. Yep. Apologies.
apologies for not being able to introduce you, Tom. Oh. So, any I'll questions? No, no, don't run away. Well, any questions? Oh, gosh. I know I did mention that. Yeah. I, well, I'll go back a slide and say if you are interested in CDL Phase 2 in particular, um, please do actually subscribe to our newsletter. That is going to be the fastest way to know about that. But this is an activity that we think will be of benefit to all the other projects that we're running as well, as well as to researchers more generally. If you didn't pick it up, there is no theme like language or a particular data type. Uh, by looking at data held by the GLAM sector, we're actually predicting that this is applicable to researchers across HASS, uh, not within a specific area. Yeah. Tom, can you tell us a little bit more about how you are thinking about focusing on the GLAM sector? <laughs> First of all, through a different activity um, than either. So we, we're not going to continue the securing data um, activity at this stage. Um, we have a new program area that we're calling Exposing uh, GLAM and Indigenous Data and that will have several projects under it. Uh, we're in the scoping phase for those right now. But uh, a, uh, if I can give un, unvarnished thoughts at this stage, then um, a, the GLAM sector is an interesting partner for us in NCRIS uh, because of our requirement around co-investment. Um, and uh, in recent conversations, what we've come to realise is that we need to actually really focus on what are the common um, challenges that we face with the GLAM sector, rather than saying, we want you to change how you do things to benefit researchers. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, when it comes to Trove in particular, I think there's a huge uh, opportunity there. They, they're doing a huge technological refresh at the moment. And although that's our natural space in ARDC, I actually think uh, what we really need to focus on is the fact that we have overlapping communities and that we should be doing activities to draw out those, acti uh, those, those uh, common audiences such that when they articulate their needs, we're both hearing it at the same time so that we can identify future activities that are in both our interests uh, at once. And the third thing is that we are actually a partner to um, the National Library in particular, and I don't think, I want to re-engage the organisation in that relationship and, uh, and work out what we can do with that, with that as a point of entry with that particular organisation. Um, yeah. Thank you. Is there another one? Here we go. We've got another microphone coming up too. There, someone's is working. Oh. Funny is. Oh. oh, I think of that way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just have a question that you touched on it a little bit, I guess, just in terms of the capacity and the resourcing within especially small to medium organisations that you're working with and partnering in within the GLAM sector. and. What are the learnings in terms of how you work with those organisations and resourcing their capacity to be able to engage without sort of, I guess, making that a driver of their work? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think there's, yeah, a, a few thoughts. I think, so traditionally we would have gone and said there are technical concerns that we want to tackle. But again, I will lean into it, the same thing that I was saying around the, the National Library. Um, what we really need to work on is articulating our common audience um, because uh, the GLAM sector has that mission to work with their audience but doesn't necessarily understand or is able to appreciate um, what, the, um, what the nuances are with the research audience. So I think that's the, the opportunity for us to collaborate. Um, I think the, the second side of it is also is an activity around sharing benefit. Um, so uh, it, this is something of a fraught uh, dimension in the relationship between the research sector and the GLAM sector is ensuring healthy relationships between um, researcher outputs um, 
which are seeking impacts on society, um, the economy, uh, the environment, and so on, and actually having been, been sure to uh, direct that um, a benefit back to the, the GLAM sector in the first place, because uh, only by sharing that benefit can we build really strong relationships. That's not to say that there aren't researchers out there who do do this. Um, there definitely are. Uh, it's just about trying to make that more common, if you like. Grant, can we... We're running over time. We, we, yeah. Yeah, real quick. Uh, thanks, Tom. So I'm just interested in, you, you mentioned the, in, you, you know, using RO crate and getting these at-risk data sets and decoupling um, retention and presentation. Yeah. And that there were learnings from that. What, what were those learnings? <laughs> you said it was quick. Uh, <laughs> It, might be, that, a good, it I, might be a good one for... That is actually really, yeah. like, uh, put a glass of champagne in my hand and I'll uh, and hit go and I'll, um, <laughs> and I'll, um, I'll tell you later. Um, but, yeah, they're significant learnings, um, for sure. Uh, yeah. That's all. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yep. So, Tom, when do you cut, cut scrub? When do you leave this whole space? Not everybody knows this, Grant. Uh, well, it was announced yesterday. Jenny Splat... Yeah, but that was the partner's day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I was only talking about this afternoon when you're going to cut scrub. <laughs> cut scrub is leave, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, five. five. After he has his glass of champagne. Um, I noticed IP, Alex IP on Arnett, he would have an interesting question. You've seen him? Keep. No, no, I was only looking at it. I wanted to know what the dog was going to ask. Um, our last presentation for the evening will be with Tomas. Where's Tomas? Hey, I thought you were security for Michael. Um, <laughs> Matthew and Herman. Come on. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking uh, about two projects that are quite different from each other. Uh, so I yeah, will try to link them as well at some point. Um, so the first one is uh, Geosocial Demonstrator and the other one is Enhancing Metadata for Inclusive Research on... Oh, I can't do it on one breath, sorry. Entrenched disadvantage. But before we do this, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we meet on and pay my respects to the elders, um, past, present and emerging. Okay. So, because um, these are two very different projects, I will start with a brief overview and try to link them somehow. Uh, so it looks like we've got a coherent package. Um, so there are four, um, well, there's actually presented three features of our projects that are common. Uh, so they are data-focused, national in scope, collaborative, and they have wide potential user base. So the first one, the geosocial data integration service, which integrates information on people, places, time, and space, that was part of a bigger project, uh, integrated research infrastructure for social sciences project, IBIS project, that was uh, one of the original projects within the ARDC uh, Haas plus I research data commons. And, and it's national in scope and focused on data because we try to enhance uh, individual level data from the longitudinal survey of Australian youth. Um, and we want to enhance this data with geosocial information that's derived from the census that helps to capture the features of the communities and places where people live. And it's collaborative because that was um, a an effort led by ISSR, but we, well, with huge inputs from OIN, uh, but also from other partners. And we, we believe that it could be used by researchers across many disciplines. And the other one, uh, which we actually call it social sciences metadata pilot project, that, that what it was, but there's the official title. Uh, it's a six month pilot project uh, that's focused on PLIDA. You might know it as MADIP, so the Integrated Administrative Data Asset that we've got in Australia. Um, and we focused on just one bit of it, which is higher education. 
And the idea was to um, look at the metadata and the ways how we can improve it. And again, PLIDA is a national resource covering the entire population. Um, and it's collaborative because we worked with the ABS and also the uh, Department of Education. And we had inputs from researchers across multiple uh, universities as well as agencies. Um, and well, again, a wide potential user base, many disciplines, many agencies, many universities, and hopefully someday also communities because this is for now fairly closed. Okay, so I will start uh, talking about the geosocial then Herman will take over and explain the nitty gritty of the project and Matt will talk about the uh, metadata project. Um, so as I said, the geosocial demonstrator or uh, geosocial solution was part of the IRIS project which aimed to address the issue of fragmented um, data for social science in, in Australia and the idea was to give researchers the ability to, to generate new data, to well, also integrate data, disseminate data, and use it uh, to generate uh, new insights. And this was just one of the packages. And the problem, well, uh, what was identifying as the problem was the lack of, I wouldn't read the notes anyway, but thank you, um, um, the, the lack of integrated data that would link information about people, places, and do it across the time. Um, and, you know, even if researchers wanted to do it, it's not that straightforward, and they might not even understand all the methodological problems at first. So when I, was, when I first faced this problem, I said, hey, that's easy, but then I started digging a little bit deeper, and it turned out that's actually more complicated. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to help researchers to build a tool that would allow to integrate data, major longitudinal surveys in Australia uh, with, with some extra data, enhance it with some geospatial data, but primarily data derived from the Australian census of population and housing. And, yeah, and then we want to answer quite some research questions and provide some insights about the Australia. So that's why we've got Australia on the right hand side. But once we bring in uh, geosocial, uh, geospatial uh, identifiers to link the data, we have to deal with the person on the left, which is the data custodian, who wants to police us. Yes, well, data custodians don't like sharing data on locations because that creates risks for, you know, people can be re-identified and so on. So we needed to take into consideration when we designed the tool um, and we designed it in a way that uh, people have to secure access to the data and we provide them with a tool that helps them to the linkage on their own machines. So we are not hosting any data, we're just providing something that, you know, we can help them fetch the data from different places, but they have to have permissions and so on. Um, and when we thought about this solution, how it could work, um, we thought about potential users and we decided to focus on, on two levels, I mean, two types of users, the mid-level user and, and advanced user and mid-level and advanced um, is about the skills they've got, about the skills around manipulating data, integrating data, understanding how to use specially structured data and, and how to produce models with that data. And the thing is that if you wanted to deliver something for uh, people with lower levels of skills, we would have to design the analysis for them more and probably host the data and so on. And that would involve many other issues which we wanted to avoid. So we just defined some uh, requirements for these two groups of people and build this tool. And it looks like this. And Herman will tell you how it works. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so the idea to, I want to start first in argument why we can enrich the data and which benefits can bring this uh, process. So one of the most important thing is we have longitudinal spatial data. For example, people are following 10 years, students or uh, other information. But when we link with geospatial data uh, for, from the census of another type of data, we can bring a lot of a uh, context to this data, and it's one thing called uh, autocorrelation or a spatial autocorrelation, and is 
a famous person called Wilder Tober that mentioned that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. This means that the behavior of the people that are close to us, we have certain special patterns that we can uh, enrich and explode of this data. So for example, with geospatial data, we can do one uh, model called geospatial weight regression, that is a spatial regression that everyone knows, but we can introduce how my neighbor affects my behavior. And that things can explain, for example, we can have population income, and in a certain way, we can expect crime. Uh, <clears throat> so the idea to this project is try to help to research to create a simple uh, way to merge this data. And the presentation today is trying to show the main takeaways to we learn with this project and is how complex can be linked data. And one of the main reasons is because everything is changed in the time. So for example, we have the behavior of the people is changing. Every year, people move to postcodes or move to new houses with the prices of the house is inevitable. And as well, the city is changing. So we have new suburbs, we have new boundaries, we have new spaces that are changing all the time. So we need to, in a certain way, try to connect this together and have in the same time and dimension to be comparable and do this spatial time uh, comparison. So uh, the census ABS have some uh, approaches to do this. So for example, across the different census, we have different years, for example, 2011, 2016, 2021. So the question is how we can pass from one year to the other. So for example, I'm observing 10 years of people, and I want to do a comparison in social science in the same year, I need to transfer everything the same. So they have something called concordance and con uh, co correspondence that basically enable us to move from the past to the present or the future. And it's kind of like you try to transform one shape to the other one. How works this? Uh, ABS used the population to the previous uh, geography to the new one and try to map how many people are living in this place. So for example, in this picture, we have 2011 versus 2016. One place was split into, into two new suburbs, for example, or smaller uh, or areas. So the correspondence can allow us to pass to the new mapping. So this can be, this is a simple way to do it, is more advanced model, uh, you can do this. But one of the challenges was the correspondence. Uh, and another challenge to we start to understand in this project is causality and temporal lags. When some phenomena happens, we don't have a direct mapping on the time. So we can have possible lags or temporality uh, time. So we need to organize this. We have spatial uh, changes. So for example, in geospatial data, we have different boundaries. It's different uh, representation of the earth that we can try to work. So in order to have this analysis, we need to organize, uh, like normalize all in the same system. In addition, and this one of the main challenges as well is the semantics. The variables are changing all the time as well. So for example, in the left, we can see how the income we can change in the different levels that is in the census available. So if we wanna do a long-term analysis, we need to find a way like how we can organize this different, how this uh, metadata is changing on the time, and how you can do a comparison across the different years to have consistent results. Uh, so in order to mix all the, this uh, challenge, and as well the comments that uh, Tomas mentioned about the data custodians, we develop a health, health social server design I try to introduce and connect with the other work package in the IRIS project. So as we start mentioned, we have six work uh, package and we need to try to connect across the whole project and try to create a solution like can connect with APIs, with uh, data that is protected by data custodians. So we propose 
given that we cannot run this in the cloud, an air library like allows you to use the same flows that users. So a library like centralized uh, the main functions and the main flows like you can use when you are doing a, a geospatial merging. So instead to writing a lot of research, are writing the same code in different parts. So we try to centralize the main functions. For example, we have our function that centralizes the, uh, the concordance and cor uh, correspondence and all this flow in a simple way. Like we can, uh, instead to do the duplicate work, and just do this uh, in a simple way. So we, this is to the mid-level users, but we have as well a, a high-level users. We have as well mid-level users, like doesn't have the very high knowledge in R. So we create a user interface, like I'm going to show uh, a UI, like allows us to do the linkage and all the process without writing a code. Uh, so all this project was uh, tried to prove this concept. So we create a demonstrator. So to do this, we basically use a real longitudinal survey that is called Longitudinal Survey of Australia Youth. And we use the Geospatial Dataset Time Series Profile 2021. The motivation to use Time Series Profile 2021 is because they allow us to delete the problem of the semantics. So basically, Time Series Profile is the ABS, the three last census, and they do a comparison of which variables make sense to compare a lot of the three different census. So which variables are equivalent uh, across the time. So we just focus in the spatial dimensions and how we can transform things in the, uh, the same spatial dimension that is 2021. So the demonstrator basically read the data, verify that the data that is introduced into the system is legitimate or good data, convert the data to the same GRs, like do uh, conversion with the con uh, concordance, link the data, and export the data in the same format that was original. Usually this data is in Stata or R files, so we try to preserve the same format without a damage the original state of the data. So I want to show some mouse here. Ah, this, I think, is moving. Yeah. This is an introduction of the user UI that we create about this project. So basically, the user UI try to uh, engage with the user that doesn't have the knowledge, and we have two different flows. So allow the user to linkage the data. They can select uh, which data set they want to uh, merge, or they can choose a more a special flow to do uh, or coding by itself. So for example, in this case, we can choose uh, the LC2009 we can choose different years of the people to we want to ana uh, analyze. So, for example, different courts. You went out, for example, 2010, 14. Which variables are relevant for us? So we can just choose, in the context of the longitudinal survey, which variables are important in this study. And we can uh, choose as well the geospatial data that we want to enrich this project. So, for example, we have the census uh, data set. Uh, in this case, we can choose which year you want to prove, uh, add to the original data, and we can choose which variable for the census are relevant in this case. Uh, so at the end of the user, given that we don't allow to run this in the cloud, he will be or she will be download, uh, uh, can link the data uh, into the local computer in your folder on your personal desktop, or you can connect to the API where the data is host after you pass all the requirements of the data custodian. At the end, the user can download a folder that contains the R code, R documents, uh, like a, a folder that contains a, a PDF that explains all the functionalities on the layer library. Like basically, we try to avoid to reuse or do the same functions. And we have as well main script that run these uh, functions and a readme file that explain to the person of which is the flow that we are following. Uh, so yeah, we try to improve this. So the idea today is try to listen to some comments at the end. Uh, but yeah, this was, uh, thank you.
me. Okay, great. Um, thanks. So, um, you know, I'm, I am conscious of time, so I'm going to kind of zoom through these. I know everyone probably wants me to talk longer, but I actually want to <laughs> want to get to that champagne. So, um, so um, I'll talk a bit about what we kind of colloquially call the, our um, metadata pilot project. Um, and so this kind of comes about in a context where there's um, expanding data infrastructure for social scientists, and, and one of those um, resources is Plida, right? So Plida, if people aren't familiar with it, has a lot of different administrative data sources that, that um, are being, have been linked together. So things like census, um, some data from Medicare, higher education data, um, tax return data, all gets linked together. Um, and then researchers can access that data through a kind of secure um, uh, remote desktop, basically. Um, and so it is quite locked down, as Tomas mentioned. Um, and, but to really capitalize on this, researchers really need to understand the data. And because the data are administrative in nature, they're not collected for research purposes. Originally, there's not a lot of information about them. And so we looked only at the higher education data, and um, we are trying to enhance the information available, especially to like new researchers that might be accessing these data for the first time. Um, and so we're doing that in a few different ways. Um, the first is we're reviewing um, some uh, metadata standards and documentation. We're also looking at um, what metadata is available for the higher ed data in Plida, and then we um, did a series of user experience consultations with experienced users of the data. Um, and then we have a couple more, so this is still in progress, so a couple more work packages to go, um, which will kind of synthesize things um, together. Um, so this first work package, we um, re reviewed metadata standards, and um, uh, kind of a lot of the work that's been done has really been looking at it from kind of information professional's perspective. And so we wanted to look, think about more about the end users, researchers, really social science, social scientists um, for our purposes, and look at kind of what do they need to be able to, in the metadata, to be able to assess data quality, right? So there's several things, including the institutional environment. So that's kind of things like uh, the purpose and the process of the data collection, um, how relevant the data is, the timeliness, the accuracy or if there are data uh, quality issues that are known, um, the coherence, so how comparable are these to other collections, um, interpretability, interpretability. Um, so that is really about like, is there a metadata to help um, researchers understand and, it, and correctly interpret whatever findings they get, um, and then accessibility. Um, Another, oh, that was the first part. Um, another part of this um, was uh, looking at examples um, already out there. And so um, we review administrative examples from um, different places overseas. Um, we also reviewed some examples from non-administrative data sources like um, the HILDA survey, which is collected for research purposes. And um, we are trying to kind of describe best practices uh, and what we'd kind of like to see implemented in Plida going forward. Um, the second um, work package looked at, okay, what metadata exists for this module that we're interested in, which is higher education data. Um, and so that kind of comes in a few different parts, right? So first we looked at um, what metadata and documentation, what information is there within Data Lab? So that's when you log in to the secure environment that you have to do all your analysis and what resources are there for you, you know, located next to the data to help you as a researcher understand that. Um, then we also looked at are there resources outside of Data Lab publicly available on um, different websites to, to help researchers understand what's going on or to help, you know, researchers who haven't yet gotten access to the data think about projects um, or think about their proposals uh, and so to understand what's in the data before getting access to it. Um, and then we also ran some targeted consultations with data custodians and data providers. So like the university was the ones that actually provide the data to the Department of Education in the first place. The Department of Education um, is the one that provides that to ABS who does the linkage. Um, and so uh, consulting with them to kind of figure out um, if there are kind of resources available. Um, and so the, what is available within Data Lab is very basic. So there are some um, descriptions of the variables, descriptions of the coded values. Um, and they're 
relatively complete. There are some small gaps, but it's like mostly there. Um, but the, and then the, the information that's outside of Data Lab is, is really quite fragmented. So there's not, um, it's not um, discoverable, especially to people who might not be as familiar with the data. Um, there are different resources covering different parts of the data. Um, the taxi website, the ter tertiary collection of student information um, is probably the most comprehensive, but it's not really designed for, um, designed with researchers in mind. Um, and then there's also just a lot of information that like we probably would like and, and really need um, as researchers that's just not available at all. So a lot of this is like contextual information, assessments of data quality, um, information about data limitations, um, data analysis advice or best practice, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then lastly, we ran um, a, a, a group of um, user experience consultations. So um, we kind of had three questions that we wanted to know from experience Plida users. And it's like, how do you build your understanding of the data? How have you gone about that? Um, what are your, like, how do you perceive the strengths and weaknesses of the current offerings in terms of metadata resources to be? And then what improvements would you like to see? Um, so I guess the first thing I'll say about this um, is just that when we run these types of projects and we, we ask for like consultations from users, it's always a chore to get people to, you know, clear time in their schedules. We doubled our target and no one said no. And we had other people that we didn't even contact trying to get us to talk to them about what they wanted to see in metadata. So it's a problem where if you work with this data, it's, a, it's something that has frustrated people to the point where they feel like they need to talk and vent a little bit. Um, so, and, and that's, I think, in large part because building a knowledge base and, and really trying to begin to understand these data sets because they're so big, because the documentation is not great, because they're not collected with research in mind, it is not a straightforward process and it can feel very arbitrary. Um, and, and I think, was it Rob that gave the example of kind of like accidentally stumbling a, across this uh, and being like, oh, there's a problem because I happen to know from some other way that this language should be in there and stuff. So that process is very similar to what people are describing where it's like happenstance a lot of the time that, that gets them. And so a lot of people don't know what they don't know and that makes them very nervous um, as researchers. Uh, and, and so that's kind of one of the impetuses for this. Um, now having said that, they were very like hesitant to critique the ABS and the data lab folks because they understand that like resourcing to build these um, assets is just not there. So they, they don't want to blame the ABS, certainly. Um, and they note that like the staff are super helpful, um, but that a lot of the way that they build their understanding is like through contacting people, through building professional networks, which is great, except that it's, it's a cost to those people, right? So the, if data lab staff are answering questions to um, to every user and that user base continues to expand then at some point we're gonna you know run into resource limitations even more than we already have um, but again this they also felt that um, this contextual information is incomplete um, sometimes it exists but it's really not findable unless you again like kind of stumble across it um, it might not be organized in uh, or uh, kind of located intuitively for a researcher to come across. And a lot of the problem is that, you know, someone starting out is they don't know what they don't know. And it's really hard to get that understanding except over the course of many years, which is not ideal, right? Um, and so for, for future steps, um, the, the first thing we want to do is continue with this pilot project, and that's synthesizing some of the findings from the three work practice I talked about today, which had just kind of been finalized last week um, and kind of design, go back to our, the users, go back to our steering committee, go back to the data custodians and talk with them about designing plans um, to bring kind of to improve metadata more broadly for Plida um, and then also to create a plan to track progress on this uh, over time, over the longer term. Um, and then we also have kind of future collaborative works hopefully in motion that where we're trying to um, kind of expand again, expand findings here, maybe implement some of the things that we um, have found and, and try to like actually produce some, some outputs with some improvements. Um, so with that, I'll stop there and thank you guys for your um, attention.
Well, unless there's a burning question, unfortunately we have gone a little bit over time. But are there any burning questions that people want to ask? Tom. Well, I am, well, I am. Come on, brah. Okay, so I, I want to start this by commending the approach that you've taken to this, and I have to really point out the contrast between working with reference data and building infrastructure around that is a really different challenge to what we've seen in the data collecting um, communities. And I love the way that you are doing these short um, demonstrator style pieces of software that actually build on what you have, knowing that say variables could change in future years, the nature of the data collection could change at any moment and so you're putting the right effort in I think um, to uh, be able to pivot when that change happens if you like. I'm wondering if you see a way of doing this uh, that allows you to have a better flow of information back to, or a more useful flow of information back to those reference data holders, the ABS in your case, um, such that they feel that they can incorporate changes that come out of the work that you're doing as well, um, you know, like more in a kind of pipeline type way, yeah. Um, Just a simple uh, question. Yes. Be interested Thank you, of course. Um, it's not really the ABS uh, that, that should um, provide this better information. It's the data custodians that produce the data. They know the data best. And one of the issues that we found is like, there's plenty of analysis out there uh, that already provides in contextual information. So there are footnotes and stuff to better understand the report by, for example, by the Department of Education, right? Um, all of this information sits in the department, well, this knowledge sits in the Department of Education. They could try to collate it and, and give it to the ABS. The ABS doesn't have the resources to, to, to do this. Right, so, so, but yeah, well, this is part of a bigger process, I, th I hope, and we will eventually uh, do it, post probably, you know, resource by resource in trying to improve, actually working on improving one resource and maybe learning from that and trying to build this pipeline in the future. I mean, we still already have some recommendations what should be fixed in higher education data, but there are other collections and there might, have, there might be different issues there. Um, but it has to be you know, basically one by one review. Um, and, but we will try to have some standards at some point. Okay, this is what we want from this metadata, right? And, Next time, hopefully, someone brings their data to the ABS, they will have to fill all the forms that we prepare for them. Thank you. <coughs> this future reference, you could have just also said, pass. Next question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ladies, gentlemen, uh, that brings us to the end of a long day. Thank you very much for your time and your effort and your participation today. Thank you to all the speakers.